Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Bryson, not present. Um, Ms. Hale. Here. Ms. Hughes Scandies. Here. Mr. Smith. Here. Ms. Treem. Here. Ms. Wall. Present. Wallachida. Not present. Ms. Ladyshevsky. Not present. Madam Mayor. Here. A quorum is present. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Ms. Hale. Sorry, I went out of order a little bit. Ms. Hale. Please do the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We would like to acknowledge that the city and borough of Juneau is on Tlingit land and wish to honor the indigenous people of this land. For more than 10,000 years, Alaska Native people have been and continue to be integral to the well being of our community. We are grateful to be in this place, a part of this community, and to honor the culture, traditions, and resilience of the Tlingit people. Kunarshish. Thank you, Ms. Hale. Um, any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. Special order of business. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you give instructions for public participation? Although we probably haven't anybody identified themselves. But. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I did not look at the back of the room to see if we have anyone that signed up, okay. but let me check that out. But no, we did not have any advanced signups um, according to our rules. There's no one signed up. There's no one signed up. No one signed up. <laughs> All right. No one has signed up in the room, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Kate. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, please note Mr. Bryson has joined us, and we will go on to agenda topics and item A, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is public hearing for Ordinance 2021-08. Version B as amended AP, an ordinance appropriating up to $800,000 to the manager for the Eagle Crest Gondola Capital Improvement Project. Funding provided by general funds. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Mr. Manager. The purchasing officer is processing bids to transport the gondola from Austria to Juneau, which was initially estimated to be $400,000. However, the potential lowest bid is nearly $850,000 and the other bid is nearly 1.12 million. With CBJ having contracted to pay 1.34 million, 1.23 million euros for the gondola itself, plus the engineering inspection costs, loading export fees, employee travel costs and attorney's fees, there's insufficient budget authority in the existing appropriation to sign a contract for the transportation. Given the gondola transportation bids, a $500,000 supplemental appropriation is currently necessary to fund transportation at the lower bid. I recommend you adopt this ordinance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. And we didn't have anybody sign up to testify on this one. Although I see that we do have Dave Scanlon in the audience if uh, we need to ask him any questions. Um, first, let's go with questions. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Manager? Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Manager, could you give us an update on how conversations with Gold Belt are and their potential willingness to spend up to $10 million for this project? Thank you. Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have met with Gold Belt, Mr. Scanlon and I, and we had a very good conversation. So I feel very, um, I feel very comfortable that a deal is achievable. Um, we, we talked through their general thoughts. Um, and it really is uh, a purely economic deal that they're interested in. So I think there was some trepidation from uh, members of the public that there might be a control issue at Eagle Crest, and I don't foresee that to be a problem. Uh, I've also been in a lot of contact with the municipal attorney, uh, and he is uh, going to be using outside counsel who's worked on uh, complicated uh, public-private contracts that we've had uh, in the past. Uh, so I think that's a really good resource. Uh, so I, I, I feel very optimistic uh, that a deal with Gold Belt is achievable. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Any follow-up, Mr. Smith? Any further questions? I have a couple. Um, where are we in the negotiations to purchase this? <laughs> have we bought it, I guess, <clears throat> is the question. <laughs> 
Yeah, yes, Madam Mayor, we are well on our way to owning a gondola. I don't remember exactly how much money we have spent to date, but it's close to a million dollars that we've spent to date on the gondola. And that's because after the last, I believe it was committed the whole meeting in early April, uh, our city engineer, our city engineer, ski area manager, and a contract uh, engineer went over, inspected the gondola. It, uh, my understanding is that uh, it was exactly as was described in good, good to great condition. And it's on its way to being disassembled for loading and the target date for the CBJ to get title is May 20th. All right, thank you. So that will be my next question since we now seem to own this gondola, what happens if we don't pass this ordinance? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> we would be in a very difficult position uh, having spent uh, a lot of money to purchase and own a gondola. Uh, on another continent without the funds to move it. So I don't exactly know what we would do, uh, but I cannot think of, I cannot think of a good outcome um, or something approaching a good outcome if this ordinance doesn't pass. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. Any questions? All right, seeing none. Mr. Bryson, why don't you move it? Madam Mayor, I don't have a, the ordinance in front of me. What was the number of? Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Um, I move that the assembly adopt ordinance 2021-08B as amended AP, ordinance appropriating up to 800,000 to the manager for the Eagle Crest Gondola Capital Improvement Project provided by general funds. And I ask for unanimous consent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bryson. Any objection? Uh, Ms. hughes Candies and Ms. Train. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I will keep this on the shorter side of things. Uh, there's no need to beat a dead horse. We've had several conversations about the gondola as a whole, as a larger topic. I voted against the purchase of the gondola. I feel like it's a bad um, route for the city to go. I further feel that it was a bad process that we followed. I appreciated that being your last question, Madam Mayor, because uh, it's a very good one with money committed already. What sense does it make not to spend this money tonight? We have an asset then in a different country that we can't access. But even so, I can't in good conscience put more public money towards a project that I don't feel like we should have in the first place with a deal that we have not seen the terms of based on a verbal report that it's moving in a direction that we could achieve a deal. Uh, I think we shouldn't take our duty lightly that it's incumbent on us and it's incumbent on the Eagle Crest Board to make sure that's a good deal for the community. So I'll stop there, um, but just I, I can't vote for this even knowing that we've already started down this road. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hughes. Candies, Ms. Treem. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't need to speak to my objection. I can't wait for the day that we never have to talk about this again. Uh, thank you, Ms. Treem. Uh, Mr. Bryson, okay. Um, Madam Clerk, we have a motion and we have objection. Please call roll. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for um, approval of Ordinance 2021-08-BAMAP. Uh, Mr. Bryson. Yes. And Ms. Hale. Yes. Ms. Hughes-Candies. No. Mr. Smith. Yes. Ms. Treem. No. Ms. Wall. Yes. Uh, Mayor Weldon. Yes. Motion carries five yeas, two nays. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, second item, uh, item B, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is bid award RFB 22-280 Eagle Crest Gondola Shipping. Thank you, Madam Clerk, Mr. Manager. 
Madam Mayor, we opened bids on the shipping of the gondola on April 21st. And I recommend award to Linden Logistics for the total bid amount of $845,163.50. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. Any questions from the assembly? And I'm skipping public hearing because we had nobody signed up. Um, any questions from the assembly? I might I have one quick question for the storage. We just had no response. On the storage piece, it says no bids were received. Mayor, I'm, Mr. Scanlon is uh, uh, nodding his head that that is correct. No bids received for the storage. All right, thank you. Um, with that, uh, Ms. Huskanis, would you move? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the assembly accept bid award RFP B22280 Eagle Grass Gondola Shipping. That Award it to Lyndon and Law just. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I, it's been a while since I moved to bid. have the bid amount too, Mr. Attorney. <laughs> thank you, Madam Mayor. It would be helpful if the bid amount was read out just so we can be. Clear. Yes, absolutely. Uh, are we accepting this bid essentially? Were we okay. awarding it? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I move that the assembly award bid. RFPB 22-280 Eagle Crest Gondola shipping to Linden Logistics in the amount of $845,163.50. Any objection? Seeing none, so moved. We are adjourned. Okay, we'll call the Assembly Finance Committee meeting of May 4th to order. Happy Star Wars Day. Ms. Spiegel, will you please note our roll? Thank you, Chair Treem. All Assembly members are present in chambers besides Assembly Member Gladyshevsky and Assembly Member Wahal Gadak, who are not present. Thank you. Approval of minutes. Any objections to the April 27th minutes? Seeing none, those are approved. Uh, we don't have an agenda approval item on here, but just so the committee knows, we are going to scratch item F, that's child care stipends update and funding request, uh, off the agenda tonight due to those requesters, subsequent requests that we remove that. So that uh, topic needs some further review before we discuss it. So we won't be talking about it tonight. So we will get started with agenda topic A, Juno Community Foundation. Do we have Ms. Gilbred? Yeah, this one. Here, Trim, we, we will get the presentation up as quickly as we're able to here. Okay. And then if you just make sure you have your microphone turned on, press the red button and it will turn green. Yeah, perfect. I can begin without it being up. Sure, yes, please go for it. Hi, my name is Amy Skilbred. I live at 4477 Abbey Way. I'm the executive director for the Juno Community Foundation. And just wanna thank you for this opportunity to talk with you briefly about our role in social service funding. Um, in 2015, CBJ and the foundation entered into an agreement that combines CBJ's social service grant funds with the Juno Hope Endowment Funds into one annual grant process. Per this agreement, we provide information to the assembly about the awards and the social service funding needs, including support for those who are homeless or food insecure, victims of violence, hospice facilities, adult education, mental health, suicide prevention, health and substance misuse programs. Our grant process includes meeting with providers to establish priorities, reviewing grants through interim and final reports and interviews, a professional advisory committee that reviews letters of interest and applications, staff follow up with applicants, and committee makes decisions and recommendations to the foundation board. Grants are awarded and announced in early April and given out in July and August. 
since 2014, the CBJ grant funding has remained constant at $806,400 per year and $47,500 per year for utility waivers. Foundation funding has added between 1 million and 1.15 million per year. Through this year's initial interview and application process, we determined that a minimum of 750,000 in additional funding was needed for this sector. And that figure has grown to between 1.7 million and 2 million as we received responses from 23 agencies that we've kept at a same level of funding for the past three years. And that's in this April 25th letter that's up on, up, you can see. The 750 in additional funding would meet about half this funding need. And the reasons to increase funding include increased demand for services, 18 grantees noticed, noted increased demand, leading to a need for more staff, about 16 positions, increased wages. All grantees have mentioned the need to increase wages or have already done so, increasing wages from 10 to 100%. And some continue to have difficulty filling vacancies. A lack of health care benefits further hinders job acceptance. Increased operating costs. Health insurance increased 5% next year was noted. Building insurance, one, one provider had 180% increase in their building insurance. Rent has gone up about 13%. Food, oil, gas, cleaning supplies, and service costs have increased about 11% between 2015 and 2021. So that doesn't include this year. And then the fourth reason is decreased funding ability, um, less earned revenue and Medicaid payments than anticipated, local fundraisers can canceled. And also what's come up is limits on grant funding because organizations aren't able to fill the positions that they have. And so you can't really go and get more funds for more, um, more positions when you can't fill the ones that you have. So in closing, we appreciate the opportunity to provide the assembly with information on the increased funding needed to assist community mem members and urge you to provide the full 750 requested. Any additional funds would go through an abbreviated application process and grants would be awarded in August. And then I'd be happy to answer any questions. You might have. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Does anybody have any questions? Mayor Weldon. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Ms. Gilbert, for being here tonight. Um, so we, the request is, you said that your requests are much more than what the funding is available. How do you decide who gets the money then? Do you have a competitive process, or how does that work? We would go through a competitive process again, and just an abbreviated process for any additional funds that were received. Um, because we would open it up to those 23 or so um, social service providers who didn't increase any of their funding requests for the past three years. So, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Gobra, just so I'm clear, I obviously understand the increased expenses for a lot of these grantees, but even though inflation is hitting on that side, inflation is not increasing donor contributions or, con or, I mean, grants aren't tied to inflation or, I mean, are grants from JCF tied to inflation? As your, you know, your endowment grows, could you speak, could you help me understand that a little bit better? Sure. Um, the endowment, the way that we figure out how much funds come out of the endowment is we take 5% of a 20 quarter rolling average. So it's sort of like the firm permanent fund and it stays around 1 million has grown slowly to 1.5 million. At the same time, I look to other funds that the foundation has that support social services like our hospice fund and other things like that, which have also increased the community foundations, how much we provide in funding. Um, does that answer it or follow up? Yeah, thank you. No, that, that does help. I guess, is that, would that be expected for other types of grants that these providers and social service organizations receive as well. Uh, not, I don't. I don't know if that typically would. I think it's very hard to come by operating funds, and so we have another big funder in our state. One of the biggest ones would be the um, 
Rasmussen Foundation, but they will only fund construction or capital projects. So they're out um, as far as trying to fund long term. And um, then the Alaska Mental Health Trust also provides funds, and they do provide um, operating funds. And that's all, most all of these organizations apply for some funding from them already. Um, I perhaps should have started with this. Mr. Rogers, can you help us put in context what might already be in our budget and what the additional request, if any, yep. is? Yep. Thank you, Chair Treem. Uh, that was on my mind. I, uh, I'm glad you pointed me to it. So I think that I would point the committee to page 52 of the packet. And at the bottom of that page is a table that describes what the manager has included in the budget versus the request that is in the letter from Ms. Skillbread. Um, so if I can just walk through that table, so we're all on the same page. Uh, 853,900 is the historical grant amount, or at least in, in very recent years. 10% inflation adjustment was added to that by the manager. The incorporation of $150,000, which um, we could talk about that has been a, a previous request for the Glory Hall that our understanding was that we would roll into the typical budget process through JCF. And then also in trying to figure out just how to uh, both ease the burden on the assembly, but also maybe put Ms. Gilbred in a better position to think about synergies between organizations. We have um, in the manager's budget advocated that the Juno Youth Services and the JAMI grants, uh, which we have previously made directly to those organizations go through JCF. Um, and, and Ms. Gilbred could speak to those, but I believe both of those organizations are already grantees through, the, through their process also. So the total proposed 23 social service grant is 1.5 million 39,000. And then above and beyond that, is uh, an additional 514,000 requested by JCF, which you will also see on the decision list on page 65 of the packet. And I'm not encouraging you tonight to make a decision on this necessarily, but just if you're keeping score on the decision list, page 65, um, you will see that request about halfway down. So 1.5 million proposed in the budget. The request from JCF is just over 2 million. And then, um, uh, the remainder that is that is yet for the assembly to act on would be 514600 unless of course you choose to do something different than what the manager has proposed which of course you can do so so that amount that's proposed in the manager's budget of 1.539 you could modify in any way that you see fit thank you mr rogers mayor walden since mr rogers looked at this thing, I guess we could talk about it now. My first question is, why would we move the General Youth Services and the General Alliance for Mental Health money away from the manager's budget and put it in the General Community Foundation? That would be my first question. I would go to Mr. Rogers for that. Because it seemed, it would make sense to me to leave it in the manager's, to be honest, but. Um, Madam Mayor, Chair Treem, I don't know that I'd necessarily have any uh, specific reason to do that other than I've been the finance director for three years and we've we've never talked to these organizations and we've never talked about them. So you, you the assembly essentially have a grantee that we're not really paying any attention to. I think I would make the assumption that if they were grantees of the of JCF, there would be an interactive process um, and put them into some relative universe of either competition or collaboration with other grantees. That's not happening as part of the manager's budget. Now, there may be other good reasons to, to, to keep them as direct grantees of the assembly. I, I think that's just a policy choice. Did I have a follow-up on that question? For the General Alliance for Mental Health, and I know that we have a, a strong uh, need for that in this community, so I'm not poking at that. It just seems to me that there's other funding for that. What about the Mental Health Trust Fund or anything like that? Madam, Madam Mayor, Chair Treem, I, I, don't, I don't know. We've, I mean, I, again, I come back to my previous comment. We've never had Jamie in front of us to answer those kinds of questions, which is I think part of the reason that I'm suggesting that maybe there would be a better grantor to manage that relationship. All right, thank you. And if no one else has a question, I have a question. We do me. have okay. uh, Ms. Huskandis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is on uh, same topic of the JAMI and Juno Youth Services grants moving there. I wasn't uh, entirely clear, so we've 
had them just in the background and we've never dealt with them. And maybe this is a question for you, Ms. Gilbred, but have they also separately received Juno you know, Community Foundation grants? Um, Juno Ser Youth Services has come to us and received grants. And this year for the, I guess the second time, Juno Alliance on Mental Illness um, came and received a grant for one position. Um, I think that's about 95,000. Uh, they do, uh, the J JAMI does receive funds from the Alaska Mental Health Trust, and they do go after federal grants. They were the agency who would have been able to receive a large federal grant if they were able to hire the employees um, for the current vacancies that they have. Okay, thank you. And I just want to clarify because I Um, I do. Um, so I see that um, I'm, I'm looking at $150,000 for the Glory Hall. I guess I misunderstood this because I thought we funded it one time in FY22. So I'm surprised to see it's a recurring cost because I don't think that was the <laughs> assembly's intent. Um, as I recall, when I made the motion, it was to move it to General Community Foundation, but it wasn't just so General Community Foundation would come to us with a request for $150,000 mainly, which was a name change. It was to help put them in a more competitive process and they would have to justify where that why they needed that $150,000 over somebody else. So I don't know if we need to speak for that or we need to get the will of the body here because I thought that was a one-time thing that we did twice, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I could play the right development. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, it's Groundhog's Day. Thank you, Chair Treem. So, um, I, you know, we have a uh, verbatim transcript of that particular five minutes of that <laughs> hearing, which I've reviewed many times and did again today. Um, it, it seemed at the moment like the, I mean, it seems to staff like at the moment that the intention was that that $150,000 would be funded going forward, but it would come through a normal budget process rather than the glory hall coming to you um, in, individually and independently. Um, if we've erred in that, I think you should strike it and direct JCF to merge it into their typical uh, allocation process. Um, I might add caution you that if you do that, I expect that you're going to get a letter from the glory hall asking for $150,000, which you would then have to act on separately. So um, if, if, if staff have erred in that particular decision, I, I think it's appropriate to correct it now. Um, I will say for future next year, Mr. Rogers and next year, Ms. Spiegel, I never intended it to be ongoing. So just make that clear for the transcript for next year, but uh, Mayor Walden. I would make, um, oh, sorry. sorry. I need um, to look this let, way. Have Mr. Bryson talk, and then I'll make a motion to make that quite clear. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bryson. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I was just going to let you know that if we were going to discuss the Glory Hall any further, I need to disclose that I'm a board member. But if we're not following down anymore, or are we? <laughs> I didn't know that we were going to talk about the Glory Hall tonight. Uh, Madam Mayor, should I check to see if I'm if I need to recuse myself from this? So certainly check. So let's. Well, I can't give us a re uh, uh, recess for a moment. So that's up to the chair. But he should certainly check. Sure, we'll take a short recess for that. Okay, we are back. Mr. Bryson. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I am a member of the Glory Hall Board, but I do not believe I have a conflict as I do not receive financial compensation. So I request to be uh, not recused on this matter. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Does anybody on the committee feel that that's not okay? Okay, I see no objection to that. Um, Mr. Smith, were you raising your hand on that matter? Sorry. Um, or did you have something else? 
I thought I saw your hand before we recess. My hand was up. I, I'm, but maybe I should wait to. We can just. I'm not tracking well on this on the glory hall additional funding thing. But if, if Mayor Walden's going to make a motion, then we can. I can probably figure it out okay. then or ask questions then. Thanks, Mayor Walden. Yeah, I'm trying to make this as clear as possible because this was my intent when I made my original motion. Um, I move that we withdraw the $150,000 that we are seem to be doing in perpetuity, in perpetuity to the Glory Hall and have them go through the comp competitive process of the General Community Foundation if they need more funding than what we have in our budget already. Um, that's my motion. Does that make sense, Mr. Rogers? Is that clear enough? <laughs> Madam Mayor Chair Trim, I think what I understand your motion to do is to reduce the amount of the FY23 social service grant amount that is in the manager's budget going to JCF, but to reduce it by $150,000. Correct. Mr. Smith. And oh, sorry. may I speak to my motion? Yes. So we did this as a one-time funding and Mr. Rogers can correct me in FY21. And then we did it again in FY22 as a one-time funding just to try to help them through the COVID process. But at this time, I think that uh, they need to figure out their operations and um, not rely on this in addition to what we already give them. Thank you, Mary Walden. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. A question, and then I actually might have an amendment to the motion. Um, Mr. Rogers, could you could you explain to me the history of this? I'm I'm not remembering and not tracking. So please help me. Um, Assemblymember Smith, Chair Treem, I'll explain what I can remember, uh, and I and it's I think it's fairly straightforward. So. The Glory Hall has not been um, recently a grantee of, uh, certainly not in this amount, from the um, typical social service grant process through JCF. Um, they came to the assembly two years ago and asked for $150,000. You agreed to that one time. There was some confusion at the time. They thought they were going to get it the next year. JCF thought they were going to get the next year. It wasn't built into that year's budget. They came back in the following year with a supplemental request for $150,000 to match what they had had the previous year. Um, in a, you know, the assemblies had a number of conversations about this particular request. Um, I think staff took from that that you were comfortable with, I, and, and, and I think I'm going to just admit that I, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that we had assumed or understood that you were comfortable with $150,000 going to Glory Hall, perhaps annually, but that you wanted it to go through the typical JCF process. And maybe where we failed to get lined up correctly was that it sounds like the intention, at least of the mayor, was that the $150,000 would come from the money that was already being appropriated to JCF for social service programs rather than in addition to that amount. So the, the, the staff approach in the manager's budget has been to make that amount additional to what JCF has historically received uh, rather than inclusive of. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. So on page 52 of the packet in that table that you had shown us earlier, I think I'm confused, but maybe I'm getting it now. It, it says additional request for TGH, the Glory Hall, parentheses, funded in FY22 via supplemental appropriation, 150000 So that isn't, that that is just like more of an information note that it was done in FY22. There is a addition, there is another appropriation in the, in the current year or in the next year FY23 budget for 150,000. Your okay. understanding is correct. Very yep. good, Madam Mayor, or Madam Chair. I'd like to amend, I'd like to offer an amendment to the mayor's motion. Uh, that would be to Mr. not- Could I ask a question? Um, we have other folks in line for questions. Somebody- It's who... actually, it's actually a, just an order question. If I wanted to- <laughs> <laughs> I need a better parliamentarian than I am. Um, go ahead. If I, if I wanted to object, have I lost my place in line if Mr. Smith makes an amendment? Have I lost the ability to object to the original motion? No. No. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. M Mr. Watt. <laughs> uh, Chair Treen, maybe, maybe you should uh, afford the committee the opportunity to ask questions before somebody puts a motion on the table. Okay. I, yeah, I need a, I need a Robert's Rules class. Ms. Huskandis, do you have a question pertaining to the mayor's main motion? Yes. If you don't mind. Mr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question, I might have two questions, but my question for Ms. Gilbred would be, if this motion were to pass and that extra funding were to go away, I am timeline wise trying to remind myself when you make decisions with your pot of money. I'm trying to see what the practical effect for the glory hall would be. So the April 11th letter that's in the packet mm -hmm. has as the last page the grants for this year. And um, the glory hall is getting what we have provided for the last several years, $90,000. And so changing any of those and coming up with 150 out of this list is not going to happen. Um, I mean, everyone's been notified of their awards already and um, the mayor as well. So to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. So the Glory Hall has been notified they're getting $90,000 from the Glory or from the Community Foundation. Right. And, and if that funding were to be struck, then... The ninety thousand, they'd still get. they'd still get, right? But they wouldn't get, it. right? The, okay, you know the hundred and fifty thousand, as with any grant agreement letter that we send out that includes CBJ funds, is always contingent on what the budget is adopted. Right. But, right. But okay. Thank you. And if you could just give me a second, I have a second one for Mr. Rogers. I think I'm losing it. Can I come back to you? Yeah. Okay. Ms. Hale. Thank you. Um, I, I guess this is a question for Madam Mayor and perhaps the committee as well. Yeah, I, I just wonder since I, I, I certainly didn't plan that we would be taking actions like this at tonight's meeting. I thought we were more in still in an information mode. And I doubt that the board or the board president of the Glory Hall planned that as well. And I, I just wonder if Madam Mayor might be willing to postpone the motion until there's somebody that can actually speak to it rather than uh, being caught flat footed watching us on Zoom or YouTube. Mayor Walden. I could withdraw my motion and we could discuss it at a later meeting, but I'm just. I don't think they were expecting it because it wasn't supposed to be something that was perpetual. It was something that was a one-time thing and they're still getting their 90,000, but if it would make Ms. Hale happier, I can postpone it. Okay. My thought was just to make, my amendment to the motion was gonna to be to move it to the decision list. So then it's kind of in that hopper. We know there's, we know it's, I mean, cause as of now it's proceeding again as if it's in the budget at 150, thousand right if you if you were to remove your motion it would just be as the budget has proposed whereas we move it to the decision list we could then expect information from the glory hall and the juno community foundation anyway and might and might say what is the necessity for this versus yeah well i guess i will ask a question of miss skillbread and how you would have interpreted this would you have interpreted this as um so the assembly doesn't get involved in the competitive process otherwise, but would you have a, interpreted this as the assembly is earmarking $150,000 for the glory hall every year? Uh, to the chair, um, my conversation with Mr. Rogers on this was that um, these funds would go into the actual pool and um, decisions would be made with sort of the understanding that until the glory hall gets their feet under them, you know, that, that this is some amount that they would need. Um, and I would say that if that 150 comes out, then the page 52 needs to change from an additional $514 to an additional $664 because our request for 750, well, it included all the organizations. Without uh, let's fill it up, please. Sorry. We have 
specific organization at this time. Got it. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Student number two changes. This number would change. Uh, Ms. Gilbride, you said the number on page 52, that number would change to? Um, 664,610, and that's adding in the 150 without any specific designation to it. Got it. Thank you. Mayor Walden. I think everybody stopped, so I'll just make it simple, and I would move um, uh, General Communities Foundation additional requests to the decision list. And the manager's budget part of that? Well, we can deal with it then, correct? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Chair, Chair Treem, for, so for all practical purposes, this is already on the decision list. Um, we, we anticipated you would need to come back to it. So I, I think that direction is fine. And with it, on, and, the, and the entire thing is on the decision list. You can think about this and revisit it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Okay, we'll move the whole shebang to the decision list <laughs> and i apologize for miss gilbert for being the first one that we had to have a rocky start with <laughs> yes glad i was the first <laughs> <laughs> thank you miss gilbert all right thank you okay <laughs> okay we will move on to Agenda topic B, Juno Arts and Humanities Council. I'm gonna start with Mr. Rogers in case there's any context we need here. Chair Treem, I, I would just do the same thing again. I'll point you to page 53 of the packet. Um, and this is also on the decision list, I believe already. Um, the manager's budget, oh, it is on the decision list because the request exceeds what's in the manager's budget. So um, the, the manager has proposed to increase the, art, the Historical Arts and Humanities Council Grant Award by 16800 which is 10% of the historical award. So the award has been 168000 for some time. Um, this would increase it to um, 1843 1843 um, and uh, there's a separate communication from the executive director of the Arts and Humanities Council um, requesting instead 250,000 and that amount would be 65,700 more than is proposed in the manager's budget. Did I, everybody follow that math kind of? Okay. Do we have anybody from, yes, okay. Do you, do you wanna present anything to us? <laughs> My name is Nancy DeCherney. I reside at 3195 Pioneer Avenue, and it has been my extreme pleasure to serve this body for many, many years, longer than most of you are here. So, um, and, and I really appreciate the increase that has been suggested. Um, we've been at the static, st static funding for many years, but not static requests. And I would note that this year, our requests jumped from nine or 10 to 16 different organizations having requested funds from us, which is, um, it's exciting that Juno is so full of excitement and vibrancy and all that other sort of stuff. I, um, I think that you all should be very proud of your arts sector. And I draw your attention to the amount of money that the arts sector does bring in from the outside, outside of Juno into our community. This year, of course, was pretty exceptional. A lot of that was COVID related as was the previous year, but it always exceeds a million dollars, at least more than that. It comes in from outside of the, the city confines into our community and gets spent on um, payroll, gets spent in our shops, gets spent as, uh, as you would like to see. So I, I would like to strongly advocate that the assembly look really carefully at the arts sector as when I first started, I called it a gold mine that was renewable. We have such creative people in this community. They put out all the time and um, are really, um, as you know, uh, Sea Alaska Heritage has a vision of making this the Northwest Coast art capital of 
the world, the universe. And um, we back them up on that. And I think this community um, stands head and shoulders above most in the United States. And this draws people to our community to live, even though it's very um, hard to live here uh, for cost reasons. Anyway, I, I'm just here to speak um, on behalf, you were gonna put up pictures of my beautiful people. <laughs> Please put them up. <laughs> <laughs> the Arts Council serves as the umbrella organization. Somebody, uh, that, as you know, I'm retiring and the search committee has been conducting surveys. Reggie tells me that somebody referred to us as the mother of the arts that we nurture, grow, and send out. And um, these are all but one of the organizations that are requesting funds this year. Um, but you can see what goes on. Um, we stand, I'm here representing those folks and all of the hard work that they do to thank them and also to just encourage you to look upon the arts sector as the future for Juno. It's, it's, you're going to find that it's, um, it's what makes uh, Juno Juno and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak strongly. <laughs> You can ask me questions. I'll make it up as I go on. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Journey. Any questions? Ms. Hale. Ms. Attorney, wouldn't you say that you're the mother of the arts in Juno? <laughs> <laughs> well, not necessarily. I have always said that whatever the Arts Council has accomplished, it is because of all the people. It is has been a community effort and it continues to be a community effort. So we live in a very, very, uh, you know, it's one of those places where somebody comes up and says, hey, what if we did blah, blah, blah. And we say, sure, let's do that. And, and all kinds of crazy things go on. And I, so I do not want to take credit for the stuff. I want to give credit to the, credit to the people for being people, creative people. Thank you. Thank Anything you. else you need? <laughs> Mayor Walden. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for Ms. Deterney for being here and doing great work uh, through COVID and beyond, and before that too. But my question actually isn't to you, it's to Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Sorry, apparently I spent too much time reading my packet. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, I'm trying to support uh, the General Arts and Humanities Council, and um, instead of taking the money out of the um, general fun, I'm looking at, I'm going back in my book. So yes, people open your book occasionally and looking at the hotel bed tax. And it seems to me that uh, from our projections that uh, we're projecting 696,000, but we're only gonna um, take 639 for operations. Is there any way we could potentially uh, use some of that money for their request? Or am I going totally outside the box and I shut up? Um, <laughs> Mayor Weldon and Chair Treem, um, the, the hotel bed tax fund um, has occasionally carried a balance. Um, and it has, uh, you are not, you would not be the first assembly to have spent that on something other than um, tourism promotion and Centennial Hall. So um, remember that uh, this assembly still operates under a resolution. Um, or two resolutions really establishing first the 7% bed tax, which would be divided 4% and 3% between Travel Juno and Centennial Hall operations. Um, and then also um, an additional 2%, which was uh, voted in temporarily um, to pay for improvements to Centennial Hall. So, um, it, you know, it, again, we, uh, we, you, the assembly have funded other organizations from Hotel Bed Tax, including DBA, which is also on the calendar tonight. Um, during the pandemic, that became problematic because Hotel Bed Tax, the fund didn't have enough money. Um, it does, you know, it, it will happen hopefully in half of the years that my projection is too low and we'll take in more hotel bed tax and then there will be a small balance that we don't somehow reallocate necessarily. Um, I don't know necessarily that I would advise you either for or against using hotel bed tax rather than general funds. The, the, the thing I would caution you with is that if it becomes an ongoing um, funding necessity, um, 
it eventually becomes a burden of the general fund if the hotel bed tax fund can't pay it. So um, I think it's really up to you. We, um, we staff did talk about this issue actually, just with the balance that's gonna be remaining in hotel bed tax. I would perhaps advise you that at some point in the future, um, improvements to Centennial Hall um, funding of the Capital Civic Center, for example, um, I think could be appropriately funded from the hotel bed tax fund balance, um, which is not to dissuade you from funding something else from there, but I, I wouldn't necessarily assume that balance will sit there forever. I think we are looking at a circumstance the next few years where that balance will be attractive for uh, capital improvements at Centennial Hall. Drivers. Can I see a hand? Okay. If, uh, since I see no further questions, Madam Chair, um, reluctantly, I would move the additional 65,700 to the decision list. Okay, thank you. I tried, Ms. Jordy. <laughs> your I see no objections to that. We will move that to the decision list. Thank you, Mr. Attorney, and thank you for the pretty pictures. Yes. I was going to bring music, but I. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you. This is such hard work, and I really appreciate your effort. So I want to thank you. 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 Okay. Moving on to agenda topic C Downtown Business Association. Mr. Rogers, can you. Yeah, thank you, Chair Treem. Uh, Alex Freybeck is here to present uh, on behalf of DBA. Um, if we just do the same little page uh, shuffle back to the decision list, um, DBA uh, is not in the manager's budget. That was the direction of the assembly, which is that it was one-time funding, which I hopefully I correctly interpreted as one-time funding. Um, but now there is a request from DBA for 75,000 for operations. And, and the only note that I would make about DBA is that um, CBJ separately unrelatedly grants passenger fees to DBA to operate the downtown ambassador program, which is separate from this request. Um, and beyond that, I think I would um, pass along to Ms. Vrabeck. Yeah. Hi, Alexandra Vrabeck. Uh, I reside at 3020 North Douglas, um, and I am the director of the Downtown Business Association, and I'm joined tonight by two of my board members, Lisa Parody and Duff Mitchell. Thank you for being here with me today. Um, so yes, I'm here to request uh, our annual sort of $75,000 in CBJ support. Um, this is really for our implementation of the Main Street program here um, in Juneau. Uh, Juneau is one of the only Main Street accredited cities in Alaska, um, and I think that it it proves incredibly effective because we have such a vibrant downtown. And if you look at other um, downtowns across Alaska, I mean, I might be biased, but I'm pretty sure ours is the best. Um, and I'm sure you all agree with me. Um, so what exactly does that look like? Um, we have sort of four main strategies. And these actually work across the various committees that we have under the Main Street sort of organization um, framework. And so that's to foster an attractive, safe, and clean environment that attracts visitors downtown, um, improve access to, from, and within downtown, uh, make downtown a family-friendly destination year-round, um, and to strengthen and build the capacity of the DBA. Um, and so we managed to accomplish the goals within these strategies um, across our three various, our three working committees, our promotions committee, our design committee, and our organization committee. Um, promotions, obviously, to sort of be that marketing engine for downtown. Um, design is actually more focused on sort of the historical preservation um, as well as design elements of downtown to keep downtown looking good. Um, and organization is really about creating a, creating a functional organization that communicates well with its partners, with its, with its government, with um, sort of the various community partners that we have. Um, so uh, Obviously, 2020, 2021 were incredibly difficult. Uh, fiscal year 22, I think we are starting to really see some shifts and change and positive um, things. But I think that we also have to realize that we're in this weird, rocky COVID-19 world where businesses are still heavily impact. Um, you know, I was talking to some business owners today that they are working to try to anticipate these cruise passengers, but they're 
you know, their employees are testing positive for COVID or they don't have enough employees. Um, and so I think where we're at right now is really to provide support to our members to create this sort of welcoming environment, not just for our visitors, but also for downtown. Um, so we've been working hard to do that, um, but you know, we're moving forward. Um, so a couple of accomplishments that I really want to just say, uh, again, for this past year, um, I mean, I'm sure many of you attended gallery walk as that came back. Um, we were also involved with, um, a, a promotion recently, and I put down that we saw, uh, I think it was, um, $40,000 in spending. It actually ended up being $70,000. I finished up counting cards today. We had saw $70,000 spent downtown between, uh, restaurants restaurants and retailers um, just in the last four weeks um, with our punch card promotion. Um, we installed 3,000 feet of lights um, to, again, provide a safe environment downtown at night. Um, and that work will finish in the fall. Um, and we will have a big downtown lighting to show off the beautiful cityscape that we have here. Um, just incredible amount of marketing, really working with our partners, you know, Travel Juno, Jack, um, I mean, everyone just to promote downtown is a really great place to spend your time. Um, so looking forward, um, as mentioned earlier, we do run the ambassador program and we are bringing that program in house or we brought that program in house last year we actually employ staff. Um, and I run that program with um, assistance with JEDC um, to really create a positive, friendly face for our visitors as they disembark from their ships. Um, we will continue to support plans for the electric downtown circulator um, and continue exploring options for increased lighting. I think having downtown as a warm, welcoming place is really important. It keeps it safe, keeps it clean, um, and keeps it as a great capital city. Um, we'll just continue to advertise market. Um, we're actually working with um, the uh, Juno Douglas City Museum to really highlight the history of downtown, including, as I mentioned, design being the historical preservation aspect. That's really something we want to work with moving forward is highlighting that history and um, promoting that. Um, and again, more, more activities to bring people downtown. Um, so, yeah, I think... I think that's most of it. Um, you know, I feel like the last year I've uh, really worked well with our board to communicate with you guys on the needs of downtown um, and also to meet whatever needs and expectations you have and want from downtown to get that voice. Um, and we will continue to do that. So, uh, so yes, please, I encourage you to continue helping us implement our Main Street program. It's an incredible uh, program that's implemented across the country and it is effective and, and really creating centers of communities that are economic engines. Thank you, Ms. Redbeck. Any questions? Ms. hughes Candies. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here tonight. I had a question, if you could just elaborate a little bit. I've heard a lot about the benefits of Main Street and I thought last year um, that DBA was still like seeking accreditation with or becoming fully accredited. So is that something we are now? Yes. And then how does funding go towards that specific piece? Or is it like, do we pay to be an affiliate or could you just elaborate on so, that yes. piece? Uh, downtown, the Downtown Business Association is a Main Street accredited program. It's an annual, basically we annually apply, uh, go through sort of a review and apply process. Um, so we recently, I recently did that in April um, and we were approved again. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's an annual thing. Um, and what they look at is the implementation of the, the four focus, focus areas that I brought up earlier. Um, and so that's done by, um, so the DBA has this work plan and this is, all sort of main street programming that we've implemented. Um, and that looks at how, um, I mean, these are annual work plans that go into detail how, how these things are implemented and the funding that goes into it and all of that. So does that answer your question? Yeah, if you could just follow up, is there a fun, is, is there a piece of that that is funded that we're paying to Main Street or it's just simply a list? There is this annual fee, I believe it's, I want to say it's in the $300 range. Really, it's just the resources that they provide and the structure for that um, and then promotion as well. Thanks. So it's it's minimal. It's not it's more like a membership. Yeah, I think. more like a membership, but they require that we kind of fit in their box and do kind of the programming that they put out. Thanks. Ms. Wall. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for being here. I'm curious about if the 75,000, is that a kind of large part of your overall budget or, you know, maybe estimate kind of how, how much um, that represents of the total DBA budget? So I, I would say yes. Um, like aside from, so our budget, um, you know, we're working to obviously grow our, uh, the way in which we operate and our expenses and income streams and all of that stuff. Um, you know, obviously I would say the CBJ grant um, does, is a substantial part. Um, and then we also obviously our memberships, we try to keep that low so that it's easy for people to become a part of our organization. Um, and then we are working to build out some uh, sort of um, sponsored member program so that, you know, we have more, obviously more income to work with so that we can do better and do bigger projects overall with our own funding. But, but yeah, it is a large portion. Mayor Baldwin, do you have a question or a motion? I have a question and I can always have a motion if you need one. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation today. And I probably am poking at the same thing Ms. Wall is. It would be nice to see a budget. So if you guys could, if you provide that for us later, that'd be Definitely. helpful to see what your revenues and expenses yep. are. You ready for a motion, Ms. Madam Chair? Uh, almost, I have one question too. You, um, at the start of your presentation said something about an annual request. Mr. Rogers has this in our decision list as a one-time request. Is it the intention of the DBA that this would be annual funding? more or less it is my understanding yes we i believe this funding started in 19 2019 and it's been an annual at least it was my understanding that it was um okay so. thank you that's a yeah we'll have to make sure we're clear on that for future assemblies uh mary walden that is not my understanding just so you know we started that to get your main street accreditation that's why it'd be interesting to see a budget so at some point we were supposed to back off and you guys rely on your membership um anyway but for now um unless there's any further questions i would move that uh um we move the downtown business association request for seventy five thousand dollars for one time to the decision list okay any objection to the mayor's motion See none that has passed. Thank you, Ms. Raybeck, for your Thank presentation. You Wait. Okay, break. It's break time. Uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. Like nine of them. <laughs> <laughs> We are back and it is time for agenda topic D, Alaska Heat Smart. Mr. Rogers, will you kick us off? <clears throat> yes, Chair Treem, let me just get oriented. So um, Alaska Heat Smart um, has requested a, a $250,000. And I think um, the important piece of that, the distinction that we do make in the decision list is that that's $140,000 of operating support and, um, $110,000, which is slightly different than what's on page 42 of your packet, um, as the working cash reserve. Um, so I think um, Mr. Benke will probably eventually get there, but packet page 42 is the breakdown of what that $250,000 request is. Um, the assembly has previously granted in many years to Alaska Heat Smart, but um, the decision that the, the notes that we had as staff was that those decisions were all one time. So thank you, Mr. I would pass along Mr. Benke. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Benke. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Finance Committee members. Um, I'm Steve Benke, President of the Board of Alaska Heat Smart. Um, I'd like to call your attention to the colorful handout that we've got here, which I'm going to refer to in a second. Um, I'd also like to introduce our Executive Director, Andy Romanoff, who's been on the job for 10 months, but uh, has an illustrious history um, We've talked about in the past because he helped run the Juno Carbon Offset Fund, which uh, has basically directly raised money and put 27 heat pumps into people's homes in the last few years, and which ties into some of what we're doing with, with Heat Smart. But Andy is now running Alaska Heat Smart for the last 10 months. Um, our grant re FY23 grant request is 250000 which includes a small increase to our operating budget, a couple thousand, but a large increment for a cash flow reserve that I'll discuss 
um, in just a minute. Um, Alaska Heat Smart accelerates the adoption of heat pumps to help the CBJ meet its climate and renewable energy goals, reduce housing costs, improve health and comfort, reduce vulnerability to oil price shocks, and create economic activity and jobs. And we do this by providing reliable third-party information, act as a bridge between people who want to get a heat pump and the contractors who uh, will sell it to them if they uh, ask nicely. Um, we've also created a heat pump loan program and partnered to reduce installation costs by developing a group purchase or thermalize campaign that's just winding up. So this colorful handout summarizes some of our progress in the two and a half years since we started up. We've assisted over 500 households. We have about 76 home assessments in the works right now. Um, requests for our services have doubled over the past year. Um, we know that about at least 200 heat pump installations have resulted directly from our advisory services so far. And we have lots of evidence for additional installations, um, but uh, that's hard information to, to get. Um, the average household adding a heat pump reduces their heating bill by about 50% or $1,200 annually. If they switch from oil, they reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by five and a half tons annually, or about the same as taking a car off the road. Um, at least nine companies are doing some level of heat pump installations in Juneau right now, and at least three of them are adding staff to keep up with demand. Um, we're quite pleased with these successes, um, but I'm particularly pleased, we want to spend some time on the, our new upcoming program that's just getting underway, which is leveraging our experience and the money you've provided um, into $2.4 million for direct assistance to lower income households. Um, so we were awarded a $2 million HUD Healthy Homes grant to address home health and energy efficiency, including heat pump installations, and a $420,000 congressionally designated grant through the Department of Energy for lower income heat pump installations. And these will allow us to, again, to do kind of what the Juno Carbon Offset Fund has been doing, which is install heat pumps into about 160 lower income households. Um, additionally, we coordinate this work with Clink and Haida Housing, which also received a $2 million Healthy Homes grant. So by sort of partnering and coordinating those, we're really uh, leveraging those. Um, we've built these programs around a bunch of partnerships and collaborations in the community. Um, builders, ALMP, Renewable Juno, Clink and Haida Regional Housing, uh, companies, contractors in the building, electrical, heating, and refrigeration uh, businesses, um, as well as statewide and national organizations like the Cold Climate Housing Research Center and the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, none of this would have worked if you folks hadn't appropriated money to us. Um, we're asking for more funding this year because this program growth sounds great, um, 2.4 million. Um, creates a big cash flow problem for us because the HUD program is a reimbursement grant. Um, so we have to bill them for reimbursement for qualifying expenses. And as we get underway, we expect to be spending about $100,000 a month to contractors to do these installations and this work. Um, HUD is not known for, they are known for being very picky and very, uh, about the billing. And so we've already in setting up, the, developing the contract, we're working on them with their sometimes get down to two or three cents off in the $2 million budget and they send it back for another month's discussions. So we really feel that we need some kind of a cash reserve to make sure that we don't wind up uh, uh, running out of cash as we, as we get this program underway. Um, we could um, we could potentially borrow that money, but as a nonprofit, um, there really aren't very many good short-term sources of loans like that. And it would cost a lot of money and it would be time consuming. Um, 
um, I guess I would say also that another goal of ours, in addition to keep it, to starting this new program and, and getting these heat pumps installed, is we want to maintain our basic set of services, um, given the interest in the community and the desire to uh, to make a dent in our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is one of the pretty specific ways that the CBJ can actually uh, make a difference in greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we want to maintain and, uh, and keep up with that demand for assistance from uh, people in the community. Um, one last comment, we're looking ahead. The new federal infrastructure uh, energy efficiency grants are expected to come out this fall. The state is also going to get a And we intend to be in the room and trying to influence how the state develops that and um, and look for uh, for funding um, to continue these programs. Um, we're also exploring ways to target and assist kind of the middle range of households that have limited upfront capital for heat pumps, but make too much to qualify for our lower income uh, direct installs. And so we're exploring. Uh, marketing, rebates, other kinds of incentives. Our congressionally designated grant gives us a little more flexibility. Well, we're not sure. We believe that it's gonna give us more flexibility. We, we haven't seen the, the, uh, the terms and the requirements for that grant yet, but we think it'll give us a little more flexibility to come up with some additional kinds of incentives and rebates rather than just using all of it for direct heat pump installations. So thank you for the chance to describe the program. And on behalf of the board of HeatSmart, I'd like to express our appreciation for CBJ's continued support. Um, and we welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Benke. Any questions? Mr. Bryson, Mr. Smith, Mayor Willen. I had uh, two questions, Madam Chair. Um, one is um, in regards to low income homes, how are you dealing with um, rental versus low income home ownership? Um, are you installing these into trailers? What are you doing ab about apartments? And my second question is, um, as you increase the number of heat pumps in the community, at what point does AELMP anticipate that there might be an, like a, not enough energy uh, to fulfill all the heat pump energy requirements? Thank you. Um, the, the, first, the first question, um, most of these, the Healthy Homes Program works through uh, residences that people own. So, so we're going to wind up working mostly with people who own their own homes. Um, in the congressionally designated grant, that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at is how we can incentivize landlords to put in heat pumps in places. And that, that's actually kind of an ongoing program that we're working with uh, ALMP on because ALMP has a strong interest in getting people off of electric resistance baseboard heats, heating and, and putting in heat pumps, because every time they do that, they free up enough electricity for two or three more heat pumps. So, so we're working, we're coordinating with ALMP um, on a, to, to develop a program that does that. Um, but again, it's that's in the works. We're intending to tackle that, to try and tackle that this coming year, at least a piece of that. Um, your second question, um, Alec Mesdag was going to be here, but had a family illness and he may be on Zoom, but I, I think that I can probably safely answer that at the current levels of heat pump installation, ALMP does not have, has not said anything about concerns. They do have some, as I understand, they have some concerns in some neighborhoods where, for example, a trailer park which has very limited electrical capacity. If a bunch of people put heat pumps into those places, they would have concerns about the infrastructure um, and would require upgrades to the 
to the uh, service to the trailer park and some neighborhoods but those are things that we're kind of coordinating with them about mr smith thank you madam chair thank you mr benke um great to read about all the different things that the program is doing you mentioned loans or a, a loan if you received a loan for your cash flow amount need how would that work um i want to refer maybe i could refer to mr rogers um about that i believe there have been dis some discussions um alec mesdag had some conversations with mr rogers about options for what we should ask what we should ask for and how to address this um and i'm not really familiar with what a loan might look like uh, actually I'll, I'll step back one, one step we we have talked about the idea of looking for some sort of commercial products and we haven't found anything that looks reasonable we also had the discussion i was referring to with mr rogers was apparently a conversation that occurred with alec mesdag um, about what kind of a request we should make and because theoretically i guess we could come to you folks and ask for a loan to help bridge this you know with this uh this cash flow issue um but it seemed simpler to to make it as a to, to make it a uh great request mr rogers do you have anything to add well church and the only thing i would say is I, I think it certainly is um an opportunity for the assembly to to take this request and bifurcate it and 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 consider granting or um, consider instead of a grant a loan for the working capital portion um if you do that i'm going to encourage you to take it out of the budget we'll do it separately as an ordinance that prescribes the repayment terms all of that subject to discussion by the assembly so i, I think that that's an option you could take um <laughs> running an ordinance and a schedule of repayment for $110,000 is a kind of small potatoes, truthfully. Um, I think what I've some of, I've talked to some of you about this today. And I think what I've said is if we expect that Alaska heat smart is a, a new organization that's in an infancy, but coming into its maturity, it's going to need working capital forever. Right? So the question is um, if it, got a loan and that it had to repay it's got to find resources eventually to repay that working capital loan so i think it's really a policy decision but it is certainly possible for the finance department to structure that portion as a loan in a standalone ordinance thank you mr rogers so can i just add, add one item to that mr smith we, we we expect to manage our cash flow so that we can handle this reimbursement but but given that we may be at points where we're spending a hundred thousand dollars a month, um, it really only would take one month of screw up on the part of HUD or somebody to, you know, that we'd be, would be hurting. So, so we, so we fully expect to manage in a way that we got that hundred thousand, hundred ten thousand sitting there this time next year. Um, so, um, and, and at least the approach we've taken so far in all of this is we've been really open about our budget and discussed it with with folks and when when we haven't needed money we've told you and we've adjusted our budget accordingly so that's kind of how i would see continue to proceed chair, chair Trim, i'm i'm sorry to interrupt we do have mr mesdag on the meeting he raised his hand which i assume he means he's available for questions if you have them just okay. know that mayor Walden. Uh, thank you. I actually have a question that I was thinking about earlier. Um, what's the difference in construction costs of a baseboard regular heating as opposed to a heat pump? So Quite my thing is, it seems to me that the baseboard register is cheaper, and I wondered what kind of incentive we would have to give builders to put heat pumps in. That's that's the that's the issue because a baseboard heater is a couple hundred bucks, and a heat pump is a couple of five, six thousand, seven thousand dollars. Um, so it's a it's a big difference. Um, they there are some potential ways that well, one thing is we know that a fair almost all new construction in Juneau, all new residential construction is putting in heat pumps. We know that the last couple of years everybody's putting in heat pumps. We think that there's actually kind of a market 
of course, of course, with the housing market and so forth, it, this may not apply as much as it did two years ago. But uh, you know, the, we think that people are beginning to recognize that a heat pump saves them money, but that hasn't translated into the rental into the rental market yet. Um, we're not alone in trying to wrestle with this because it's basically an issue all around the country and we're working, we have access to a lot of people who are working on similar programs in other parts of the country. Um, but, uh, and actually that reminds me, there's a, to jumping back to Mr. Bryson's question, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons that ALMP is quite interested in helping incentivize this is to learn some more about what the impacts really would be they have a project that they're going to they're offering to monitor uh, some existing rental units and for a year and then put in a heat pump pay to put in a heat pump and then monitor them for another year after that to get a real concrete idea of the energy savings and energy costs of that mr smith thank you and you you may not know and <clears throat> no problem mr Mankey. does is almp doing do they have any type of program to incentivize people to convert from electric baseboard to heat pumps or incentivize the installation of heat pumps in yeah. new construction? I, I happy to defer to Mr. Mesdag if he if, if you want to pull him up, but 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 the but the short answer is no, but they are thinking of it. They're they're considering it. And some of these studies I was just mentioning are things that would lead into that idea of trying to incentivize um, um, replacement of electric resistance with heat pumps. Uh, Mayor Walden and then Mr. Bryson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I told you I was gonna poke a little bit at your budget, so I'm going Sure. To, um, so your personnel, I see it's a director, financial manager, energy advisor. Is Are those part-time positions then, full-time positions? And how long do you see them having to be paid? Because it sounded initially that they were there just to kind of administer the grant, but then listening to Mr. Rogers, it sounds like you hope to maybe keep them forever. So what's your plan? Um, forever is a long time, <laughs> Madam Chair. Um, uh, but um, yeah, we see, so, so Andy's position is full-time. That's really the only full-time position. We have part-time energy, energy advisor, uh roles and we're we're in the middle of a big transition because we're figuring out how much this how what the sideboards are in this federal money we're actually hiring we're actually doing some shifting right now we're hiring we're moving a contractor into a into a, a full-time position because we need to be able to tell the healthy homes the hud that we have that position in order to get the money so there's a bunch of things like that that we're juggling right now the administrative there will be administrative money associated with hud grants so that's going to help us once we get that squared away but we we kind of have to spend some money to make some money um and uh i i guess i guess there really is a question for you folks too because the if we want to do, if we want to make a difference in accelerating heat pump adoption, we're going to have to have some kind of a program. And uh, I think that, you know, Alaska Heat Smart has been a pretty effective way pulling together a bunch of different interests to do that. Um, if, uh, if you as the city were trying to do that, it would be a whole kind of different project, I think, and cost a whole lot of different. Um, so, um, I guess part of the question depends on whether you want to accomplish the CBJ's goals for greenhouse gas reductions and conversions to renewable energy as outlined in some of your plans. Heat Smart is one of the few things you got going that can, can do that pretty concretely. Um, we are, I, I have said in the past, we're looking for grants that could displace the CBJ's money. Um, and we've looked, we've talked to private foundations. We're looking at some of these new federal programs where there could be uh, new energy efficiency programs that might be able to do some of that, but that's totally speculative at this point. They haven't even figured out how they're gonna use that money, but it is the type of thing that would be very logical for them to fund. 
are these kind of programs. We do have Mr. Mestag, so why don't we give him a shot to answer some of the questions that have been asked? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's Alec Mesdag, and I am coming to you live from 1008 Mink Circle. Um, so there were a couple of questions related to ELMP and our ability to serve heat pumps. And it is the case that if, you know, say everybody in town moved from oil to heat pumps, that that would cause a need for new electrical infrastructure. Um, but as uh, Mr. Benke noted, we uh, are very interested in seeing some replacement of electric resistance heat with heat pumps. And, and that does enable us to uh, save some energy and redirect that to heat pumps that are offsetting uh, oil heating systems. And that's something that we see already with Alaska Heat Smart that many of the people who are interested in converting to heat pump are converting from electric resistance. And, and therefore the, the total um, growth in energy consumption across town is actually not really, you know, right at this point, it's it's certainly not possible to, to distinguish a significant increase in the amount of energy that we're selling every year because of heat pump adoption. So that was one concern. And then as it relates to our need for managing our cash flow, especially with this HUD grant, which is a reimbursement grant and the and the rate of spending that we're going to be doing. This is about a four year um, I think it's just under four year uh, contract. And uh, so this will be something that we'll be doing for, for quite a while. And the idea with trying to maintain our cash reserves is just, just to ensure that as we are moving forward with the project and trying to get in and make very meaningful contributions to the quality of housing in Juno, that we will be able to continue to keep our contractors working and uh, it won't run into any issues with uh, just running short of cash in those periods when we may have some issues with um, very, you know, just kind of the minutia of the billing uh, federal entity. And this is something that, you know, we work with a bookkeeper who is also the bookkeeper for Southeast Conference, who's very familiar with, with federal contracts. We are partnering with uh, Clinton and Hyder Regional Housing Authority or coordinating with them on the implementation of this. Uh, we also are partnering with Cold Climate Housing Research Center is very familiar with federal contracting and they are actually a part of the federal government now as they're uh, part of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So I think that we have a good group of people who are aware of how we can ensure that we limit our, um, the issues that we have in billing the federal agencies. But, uh, but you know, it's just, it's one of those things. It's, it's, it, it can be something very, very small that runs us into trouble. And, uh, you know, we will uh, be billing uh, some are, you know, we can, we can charge the 10% de minimis in a federal contract. And so we will be covering some of our administrative expenses through that federal contracting, which I think is a very positive thing for the organization. Because again, when we came in a couple of years ago to, to ask for the first grant for Alaska Heat Smart, um, there were a lot of questions about how were we going to uh, diversify our income streams so that we could become a more sustainable organization over the long term. And, and I think that, you know, th that these two grants coming in, um, I hope are just the first couple of, of many that we will see coming forward and, and, you know, really to shrink the, uh, shrink the piece of pie that the CBJ, you know, uh, covers in our budget over the long term. Thank you, Mr. Mestag. Uh, Mr. Bryson had a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I think this is perfect that Mr. Mestag joined us because my question is about utility billing loans uh, to increase the number of heat pumps. Let's say that we can't just give them for free through your grants, um, that other uh, utilities, including, I believe, uh, ALMP's parent company, Avista, offer utility loans or utility bill pay loans where they loan you the money to get the heat pump and then you pay that loan through your utility bill. Um, has that been looked into for Juno and why are we not implementing that? Because that seems like it'd be a great way to get um, more heat pumps uh, into Juno homes. We are getting slightly off topic with that question, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, I can try uh, to answer Mr. quickly if you'd like. 
<laughs> yeah, quickly, please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, AOMP is looking into that as one of the two utilities, the other one being the CBJ's water wastewater utility that can also offer that service. Um, we have looked into that and there are some difficulties about how the way this law was structured in Alaska. Um, but we are, uh, we are definitely still very interested in seeing if we can make that happen. And I think the, the, the CBJ may also be interested in making that happen. Thank you, Mr. Mestag. Miss, no, okay. Uh, Mayor Bolden. I have a motion if you're ready. Are we ready for motion? I think so. Go I ahead. have two motions. Okay. I think this one might be one that we might all agree on but I don't want to uh, flummox anybody. So um, I would move that we add the $140,000, um, what do we call it, for the heat smart operations as an amendment to the manager's budget, which means we accept it. That's my first motion and ask for unanimous consent. Any objection to that motion? I see none. Oh, Mr. Smith. Question for the make. Or, so you're not adding it to the decision list. Correct. I Correct. This, this is one thing that everybody can agree on. This would be <laughs> approving that request yeah. more or less. I will speak to my motion. The fact that they got two million dollars and then four hundred thousand in grants, and they need this money to administer the grants, I'm all in. <laughs> so uh, my second. Do you have an objection to that, Mr. Smith? I, I think I agree with you too. I am a little bit more on the. On our calendar, it's decision list starting next week. We don't have a full membership here. I, I don't really, I just like, I get, I'm, it's fine. I'm just like, we, we've done everything under the decision list. And anyway, I, I will remove my objection. I will, you can tell by my tone, I'm a little grumpy about it, but I will remove my objection. I think Mr. Rogers every year is gonna switch back and forth to how he writes these calendars because we flip flop every year on how we interpret those, but we can and have been able to, and will be able to make decisions at any of these finance committee meetings. And we get grumpy every year too, don't we? <laughs> no matter which way we do it, we definitely get grumpy. Mayor, Mayor Weldon. Uh, yes, and that's one of the reasons I figured everybody was in agreement with this one, so why wait till the decision list? If it was a controversial topic, I wouldn't have moved it. Um, uh, my second motion is to move wait, the- Wait, I don't know if we- Oh, sorry. <laughs> Is, okay, I see church, no objection. Sure, church, church, just just to clarify the mayor's motion, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this every time we talk about these subjects. Is this a is this an FY23 decision or is it an ongoing uh, inclusion in the manager's budget? One, one time, as the list says. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. They might need more next year. Just kidding. <laughs> and my second motion wait, is wait. Oh, sorry. Okay. Any objection to that motion? None. Okay, I see none. Second. Motion. And my second motion is to move the Alaska Heat Smart Grants cash flow reserve to the decision list. <laughs> Any objection to that motion? I see none. That motion has passed as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mastag and Mr. Benke, and Mr. Romanoff, for being here. Thank, tonight. thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we've saved the best for last. of people presenting, we still have items on the agenda after that, but of distinguished guests to join us tonight. We will move on to agenda topic E, which is the AEYC request. And I will ask Mr. Rogers again to just set this up for us. Well, thank you, Chair Treem. Um, this is a little more uh, complicated to set up. I, I might, should I, should I defer over to you? Is this the right? I might defer to the deputy city manager who's, who's been one of many key players in, in organizing child care funding. Okay, thank you. Mr. Barr. Thank you, um, Chair Treem. So um, I think really high level here is that uh, the state of Alaska used to fund uh, three child care um, resource and referral organizations. AEYC is one of them here in Southeast Alaska. Thread is another in Anchorage, and there's a third um, in the Fairbanks area whose uh, name I am blanking on. It's not relevant. Um, and some time ago, they decided, they being the um, uh, state child care program office, decided to combine those grants into one uh, grant. 
that is administered by Thread. Um, for some years, Thread subgranted to both AEYC and the Fairbanks organization uh, to provide resource and referral services uh, to families that um, that need to be connected to childcare assistance. And, and Thread is centralizing those services within Thread. Uh, they're, they're essentially ending those subgrants at some point in the short-term future. We don't know exactly when, although Ms. Scheibler may have more, more detail on that. Um, so that is the, the primary reason uh, why this grant request is before you today in two parts. Uh, one, to provide operational support uh, to the tune of approximately $100,000, slightly more, um, to AEYC um, next year and again uh, the following year. Uh, the hope uh, is that, uh, that through coordination with the state, and perhaps other grantees that, that that support won't be necessary indefinitely, but very likely will be for two years. And then a separate uh, portion, approximately $140,000, again, slightly more, again, same time frame, a uh, two year period, um, but 140 each year uh, for um, the provision of parents as teacher services. And I would certainly defer to Ms. Scheibler and her team to um, add detail and describe those services. Thank you, Mr. Barr. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll turn it over to Ms. Scheibler and your group and just ask that if the three of you are gonna speak that you pass the microphone back and forth. Okay, thank you for your time tonight and thanks for that introduction, Robert. Um, my name is Blue Scheibler. I reside at 6726 Marguerite Street and I am currently the executive director of AEYC um, following in very big shoes of our founder, Joy Lyon. <laughs> I've only been at this job for seven months. <laughs> and uh, taking this job, I quickly realized a large problem that we had, and that was diminishing state and federal grants and revenue. Um, this is the first time we've ever been in this situation. We have been able to be funded by that child care grant from the state since um, 1996. And so it's a little bit hard to swallow to have to come here and ask for support, but I would highlight that in addition to Parents as Teachers, Imagination Library, um, Rock Juno, Kindergarten Readiness Events, um, support to childcare programs to improve quality and capacity. We also do a lot of work on behalf of the city for a relatively, we, we have been able to do that for a very small fee because we had these state funds. Um, and that is administering the Hearts Awards, the CBJ stipends, and other things, um, emer addressing emerging needs in the sector um, as they come up. For example, throughout the pandemic, we were charged with distributing PPE to childcare providers, um, COVID, rapid COVID test kits so they could do test to stay like the school districts. Um, just recently, the state of Alaska background check program um, went down with the DHSS hack. And it hasn't quite, it, it came back online, but childcare providers are now being required to buy a static IP address. And it, a lot of providers, like especially home providers can't afford that. So AUIC got our um, IP address approved and now I help those, all those people negotiate through their background check portals. Um, so those are just a few of the examples of what we do for childcare in Juneau. And um, if you, and then parents as teachers, um, we are one of four affiliates in the state. Um, we are, our parents as teachers program is so efficient and effective that we have more families than any other affiliate in the state. And um, when we built that program, we increased staffing levels slowly to be able to serve the need um, in, that the community has. We have a huge wait list of more families that need to be served. And so we have this capacity built up in staffing and we have demand, but we're losing, um, we're, there's a five-year grant from AASB that's sunsetting at the end of this year. And so we are um, trying to work with the state for revenue replacement for both the childcare resource and referral work and parents as teachers. But I do think it's gonna take a little bit of time to get that rolling. And so we're asking for um, support to stay afloat while we work on that. Thank you, Ms. Scheibler. Any questions? Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I was too busy getting kind of infuriated when Mr. Barr was talking about this money. So I'm just, could you just explain that to me how, 
So is it essentially now Thread, who is the primary grantee, has now said, no, we're not subgranting this out anymore. We're just going to keep this all. Correct. And that might be sort of like some background around that decision is um, so one of the key services that a child care resource and referral agency provides is um, child care worker training and education. Um, and when the pandemic hit and Thread realized they could do all of that virtually, they just kind of thought, well, we'll just do it statewide virtually and we won't have people in, in the other regions anymore. And so that's what they're doing. They're moving to um, all, all services being provided virtually. And I feel very strongly that that's not going to meet the needs of our provider community. And so we are currently getting really creative with funding and staffing. And for example, we have parents as teachers, um, parent educators going into childcare programs and providing on-site consultation for about infant and toddler development and how to improve the quality of their classrooms. Because what we're seeing as a result of the pandemic, um, the, the workforce shortage has hit childcare particularly hard. Um, we saw people exit the field and not come back and um, childcare programs are basically hiring the first person that walks through the door that can clear a background check and they are not, they don't have skill or education in what they're doing. that we've always had to do that. I do oh. hope I have been working with the child care program office who ultimately made the decision to only give one grantee all of the funds for the state. Um, I've been trying to help her understand how that short changes the, the other regions. And um, <coughs> I, she, we have a good relationship. We're working on it. and. Um, I do hope that to see a change. Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, it's a little stunning. Um, do you know, Ms. Scheibler, how, how the, your counterparts in Fairbanks have responded and, and you know, what, are they in a similar situation? They are in a similar situation. They are also an um, affiliate of, they are an AUIC affiliate. So they're Northern Interior AUIC. Um, and they are scrambling to find revenue replacement. Their subgrant, our subgrant ends at the end of this calendar year. And theirs ends at the end of FY23. Um, and they're looking at maybe starting a school age program. They're they're, they're trying to be creative about how they're going to replace that revenue, but they're also very concerned about continuing their operations. Thank you. Mayor Weldon. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, ladies, for being here tonight. Um, you kind of mentioned it a little bit, Ms. Scheibler, but um, looking at your sheet, your budget sheet on, I don't know what the back of page it is on, um, you look like there's potential grants for the parents as teachers, but unless um, the big grantee that gives thread the money changes. There's no other grants you could apply for for operations. Was that correct? No, not that I know of at this time. Um, our fund development plan does include looking at increased investment income, starting some planned giving campaigns, looking for corporate sponsors, um, increasing promoting our pick click give campaign and things like that. And I, those are things that I think I, we just need some time to develop. Mr. Smith. I'll move on from that otherwise kind of upsetting topic to me. Um, can I, I just had a question about parents as teachers, and I guess I was just curious about the demographics of the families that you serve. Um, if you, you could speak about that income, ethnicity, that type of thing would be great. Thank you. Sure. My name is Emily Thompson. I'm the manager for the Parents Teachers Program. I reside at 1108 Weeburn Drive. And um, yeah, so parents as teachers, we can serve about 150 children a year right now. Like we've had served 133 so far. We still have a quarter left or a little less than a quarter. About 40% of our families are low income and about 30% are Alaska Native or mixed race, um, other ethnicities. 
And we do have about 25% of our caseload, our families at any given time have two or more high needs indicators. So things like substance abuse, homelessness, um, involved with correctional society or um, disability of child or adult, things like that. But you have to have two of those to qualify as a high needs family. Um, but the biggest risk indicator that we have for most families is the low income. Um, but also about 65% of our families are first time parents. So, you know, give you an idea. Can I add something to that too? Um, the supplemental funding that's listed here would be in addition to the regular grant that DHSS gives us um, annually. And it's gonna hopefully come through the Office of Children's Services because Parents as Teachers has been identified as a child abuse and neglect prevention strategy. And so they have money specifically for that and they've identified Parents as Teachers as the, where they wanna invest it. Mayor Walden. Oh, thank you. I'll throw a motion out there and uh, Mr. Smith can be grumpy with me again. Um, I would move, I think this is something else that we can all agree on. Um, I, in, well, I'll make the motion first and then I'll speak to it if that's all right, Madam Chair. I would move that uh, we amend the budget with the AYEC grant for operations of 102,000 for FY 23 and 24. And if I may speak to my he has been nothing but a great partner with CBJ, and we wouldn't be where we were with our child care without them. So with that, um, and we're going to have to look at what we're going to do for child care here on ever after. So we'll need their assistance on that. So that's why I'm making that amendment. So thank you, Mayor Weldon. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I'm going to object not because I don't support the motion, not because I don't support the intent. I was just having conversations today about how we might be able to, I'll just say fix as opposed to avenge what happened earlier. So um, we'll, that would be my preference to maybe delay a week and delay it to the calendar decision list time or to a future decision because there may be a chance that we can do something where the state or thread or whoever anyway where funds are spread across the state as they should be. That would be my objection to it. Okay, I mean, that prompts a question. You said you have that funding through the end of the calendar year. So you're not relying on a very quick, well, I mean, this would be budget anyway, but you don't need a, a very quick decision for your planning like I purposes. Mean this would be part of our FY23 budget. So starting July 1st. And actually when I say through the calendar year, um, so what they've done um, is taper off our sub grant. And so we went from receiving over $400,000 a year to 160 and then at the start of FY23, they've agreed to give, the 160 was supposed to be the end of it at the end of FY22. And they've agreed to extend for a half of FY23, half of that subgrant, so eighty thousand yeah. dollars. Well, how generous of them. Yes, very generous. <laughs> okay, um, Mayor Baldwin. Well, if with the additional information from Mr. <laughs> Sorry. Smith, um, I will resend that that motion and make a different one and uh, move both grants to the pen, their decision list. Excuse me. I see no objection to that motion. So that motion has and, passed. And hopefully the state can do something. Yes. Okay. Thank you ladies so much for being here tonight for yes. waiting. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Moving on, the rest of this will go quickly. I promise. Yeah. Um, agenda topic G, because we are skipping F, is the manager's proposed increments, Mr. Rogers and or Mr. Watt. May I ask what page we're on? Page 51. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. So, so we pack a page fifty-one. We have a number of uh, proposed uh, increments in the manager's budget. Uh, we're going to just speak very briefly to them. Uh, the streets positions 
um, after a long discussion with our operational group, they convinced me of two things. Uh, one is that costs and street maintenance had advanced faster than inflation, which I think is, is true. So we've told them for years to hold the line with all departments. But the problem with uh, street maintenance is we add roads, we add new subdivisions, uh, we add sidewalks, we add storm drainage paths. So we, we actually have increased street maintenance costs faster than inflation. The other uh, item that they convinced me of is that while we achieved some efficiencies by building the consolidated uh, street maintenance shop at Seven Mile, we used to have one downtown and one in the valley. They also convinced me that during peak times, the consolidated shop is actually not more efficient. Uh, and, and, and the reason is um, during peak times when we're strapped for people and equipment, we end up having to move equipment around the borough more. Mm -hmm. um, I think both of those, those issues became very exposed this winter um, during our, our peak snowfall. And I don't think it's just a peak snowfall issue. I think it was just eminently obvious that we were not able to provide the services uh, that people wanted. Uh, the other sidecar issue to that is it's it's a persistent uh, complaint that I get that we are unable to allocate enough resources downtown to uh, downtown streets, uh, whether it's it's DBA or whether it's the legislature in the winter or whether it's in summer and keeping the streets clean. Uh, persistent complaint uh, from the public that we are unable to maintain that level of standard downtown. Um, so that's, those are the two uh, streets ones. I'm probably speaking to them more than any. Uh, I think the clerks, you've got uh, three, um, and we've talked about all these before. So technology support, um, uh, meeting support and election coordination. Those are all consequences of decisions that we've been working on. Uh, community foundation, the inflationary uh, increase, um, uh, and, Everybody's been hit by inflation, in, in complete, including our subgrantees. Uh, you see the Arts Council on there. So those are the uh, those are the ones that are in the manager's budget, and that's probably a good place to stop. Four questions. Questions. So these these things we wouldn't have to take any action on. Okay. Okay. I guess we'll move on. Oh, Mayor Weldon. Um, I don't, we don't have to take any action on the uh, increments, but we have a consideration on decision list. That's so, where he, he's okay. getting there. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't see that. I thought you were going. <laughs> uh, Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Chair Dream. So the next item is the um, CCFR uh, Expanded Mobile Integrated Health Program. Um, we also, I think, have Chief Etheridge on, and it'd probably be great to move him over for questions. Um, this one's a little bit of a tricky one. So you, you may recall um, that the MIH program expanded from about one and a half FTE to, I believe, about four and a half FTE. Um, largely as a result of a grant uh, that the fire department received. And um, the, the MIH program has been, uh, I, I think, highly effective in the community. Um, you'll recall that one of its primary objectives is to uh, reduce the burden uh, on the emergency department at the hospital uh, by providing uh, medical services um, to uh, individuals who don't otherwise have uh, the ability to, uh, to, to get those services through any means other than the emergency department. Um, and they've been, they've, been doing, they've been doing that effectively. Uh, they've also played a significant role uh, in, in uh, all things COVID um, when it comes to providing um, at-home uh, therapeutics and at-home tests and at-home vaccinations. So um, I, the other thing that I'll add here, and we will certainly be back before you uh, likely at a committee of the whole to talk about this, but you've probably uh, heard at least in passing about the crisis now model of response um, where communities who are adopting crisis now model respond with um, teams that are trained 
uh, mental and behavioral health professionals um, to respond to people who are in mental and behavioral health distress uh, rather than sending uh, police officers to those incidents. And when we have been working and coordinating between uh, CCFR, JPD, JAMI, um, the Mental Health Trust, and the hospital uh, to develop a Crisis Now model in Juno. Um, MIH is in, is in, we are early in that process. Um, we are going to be starting a strategic planning process soon. MIH is envisioned to be part of that, um, but it is, it is probably premature to go into too much detail on that. Um, to kind of wrap back around to why this is on the decision list is that we are uh, seeking that renewed grant funding uh, for that for that uh, expansion that that we did, um, but we are uncertain uh, as to if to we are going to get it or not. Uh, Chief Etheridge could maybe speak a little bit more to the level of certainty or lack thereof. Um, but that's why you see it uh, on the decision list because if we are unable to get that, then the only other funding source would be general funds. Any questions on this one, Ms. Hughes Gandys? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question about timing. I know that we don't know if we're going to get it or not, but when will we know? And could you expand on, uh, you? maybe I missed it just now, but what the specific grant was or like what the specific name of it was? Yeah, I, I know the acronym, but Chief Etheridge knows the, uh, the more details, so we'll, we'll go to Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, We've been getting grants through the uh, State of Alaska Division of Health and Social Service. Uh, grants have been coming out in small increments, like a couple months at a time. So uh, they just did reach out to us uh, on Monday and advise that they have two more months worth of funding to, to bring us completely to the end of this fiscal year. Um, so we're finding out about the grants like days or weeks before uh, they're actually ready to award them. So uh, it's sporadic. Uh, Health and Social Service has a strong desire to help fund these programs uh, across the state and uh, help them get established and, and find regular funding sources. Follow up. Thank you. If I could follow up. So you're saying your the grant awards themselves are two month duration at a time or? That, um, they, I'm they confused do con by what you said. Sure, they do contracts depending on how much money they have available at the time. So. Uh, if other communities haven't used their grants, then they reallocate those uh, back out to the other communities that are able to use those funding. So it's been very sporadic. So we're not currently, we haven't put in an application for a, a normal length of time, like another year of a contract or another year of a grant. No, we haven't at this point. I would imagine after the state gets their budget uh, adopted that uh, they'll have a little bit more solid foundation on what their their available funding looks like for next year. Okay, thank you. Mayor Weldon, and then Ms. Wall. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Chief Etheridge, for being here tonight. Um, so it sounds like uh, Ms. Huskani has kind of poked. Um, I would assume that if we got funding, then we wouldn't uh, have to use uh, general fund money. But my question is, it seems to kind of help the hospital and I'm wondering if we have looked at having them fund any part of it. Sorry, that's more of a question for Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. I think we're trying to figure out who's the right okay. person to answer. Um, I, I, there might be, let me just, let me, let me say one thing that I, that we do know. Um, there's probably two options for accomplishing this. One, you could somehow say the hospital, you have to pay for this. I mean, I guess you could direct them to do that. Um, the other potential is that you uh, redirect the rest of the tobacco tax. So the assembly made a decision a couple of years ago to change the amount of tobacco tax that went to the hospital. Uh, I don't have the number because it's not in this budget book, um, but you reduced it down to $518,000. So $518,000 still goes to the hospital to support uh, mental health substance abuse treatment type programs. Um, it certainly one way to accomplish this purpose would be to pull that funding uh, back from the hospital, from the tobacco tax, um, and, and have us assign it uh, to pay for uh, programs 
like MIH. Um, and then again, separately, it probably uh, not technically impossible for us to assign this responsibility and cost to the hospital, but um, not, not our typical relationship with the enterprises. Is that a good answer for you? Okay, um, Ms. Wall and then Ms. Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, kind of continuing on that same thought, I, I appreciated Mr. Barr kind of wrapping this vision into the, the larger vision of the crisis intervention kind of work with the hospital and with Jamie. If I remember correctly from that conversation, it, it was, we were optimistic at the time that there would be kind of considerable funding opportunities um, for the expansion of that program. Would, would that funding be available for this specific piece of, of that? Or, or do we think there's, there's a chance of that? Uh, Chair Trim, yes, I think, I think we do think there is a chance of that. Um, the, the crisis now model kind of involves three tiers and the tier that MIH uh, would be involved in is kind of the middle one and that is the mobile response team and providing the team that goes out to actually do that work. Um, the other partner in that team would be JAMI who would provide the higher level clinical staff support um, and JAMI has uh, been have been closely working with the uh, with the Alaska Mental Health Trust, who has expressed quite a bit of interest um, in helping fund that team. Um, and uh, the mental health, we've been in contact with the Mental Health Trust too to help provide some. They're they're interested in helping us provide some. They're interested in helping provide some strategic planning support to us uh, to kind of wrap our brains around how the whole thing comes together within the context of everything else we have going on in Juneau. Um, hard to speak with any more certainty than that right now, though. Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, probably a question for Mr. Rogers. Um, along the lines of the mayor's question about the hospital funding, um, all are part of this or part of it, and then your response about the tobacco tax. Um, I'm not sure where the hospital's out at relative to their own budget. So if we start trying to dip into the hospital for funding something like this, um, are they going to have to go like go back and readopt the budget, or you know what 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 does that mean in terms of timing of what they're doing? Yeah, Chair Trim. So uh, certainly um, the the assembly already did move to adopt the hospital budget as it was uh, uh, sent to you. Obviously, now um, that doesn't make that decision closed necessarily. You're still working on the bill. It's still in the or in the ordinance. It's still in the committee. So you could certainly at this time uh, take that tobacco tax and reassign it to another purpose. Um, the hospital would need to go back and revise its own understanding of its own budget. Um, the probably what would happen in practice is that they would delete a $518,000 of revenue and that revenue loss would fall to their bottom line and it would get managed as part of the overall budget next year. I mean, as in they would tell you that they will either spend hospital fund balance or it's a reduce a reduction to their contribution to hospital fund balance to lose that funding. Um, I, I think it would be unexpected for the hospital to lose that funding and then uh, deliver you back a budget that somehow cut $518,000 of services. That, that's probably not what would happen. They would reflect it as uh, an increased use of hospital fund balance or a decrease to what they would contribute. That's my assumption. Thank you. I, I guess I would just uh, advocate to the assembly that we we proceed cautiously with, with dipping into other entities' um, funds at this stage it's awfully nice if we give people warning instead so they know what's coming thanks mr smith thank you madam chair i was just kind of curious about data and outcomes or you know what what we're seeing um and i just i, I mean just to i'd like to hear any high points or data that you have about this program and then i guess maybe just confirm that though we might be seeing less people going to the emergency department, it maybe isn't to the point where they can reduce staffing. So they're not, they're not going to see savings per se. It's just they might be able to less burden with like better care or something. 
Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair Treem. So uh, unfortunately, Chief Etheridge is going to be able to speak to much of that, but with your mic down, he may not have heard you. So I'll, 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 I'll start and then, uh, and then he, he can maybe um, interpret uh, based on my answer. So um, I, I, would, I, I don't want to speak for the hospital. I, I, would, I would suspect, though, that you are correct uh, and that they are, they are not reducing um, any, any staffing levels at the emergency department. Um, I think they are probably generally pretty busy and they are, they are uh, likely uh, grateful. I know they're grateful um, to uh, see, see a few less of their frequent flyers who just genuinely don't need that, that level of care um, and are better served um, at home. Um, and Chief Etheridge could maybe talk to a little bit of the statistics about how many of those people we are we are diverting. Um, I, I am looking at some notes from a meeting that I was in uh, 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 last month um, when we were talking about the crisis now model and one of our MIH staff uh, shared there that um, we had in the month prior to that meeting conducted 173 uh, home visits to 53 people in that time period um, and regular engagement with case management at public health uh, and the hospital um, and uh, that, that at that time that we were uh, had a daily staffing level of uh, one paramedic and one EMT uh, 10 hours a day seven days a week so I'm, I'm sure the chief would have more to add sure <clears throat> happy to jump in Mr. Smith, maybe you want to quickly recap what you said with your microphone on. I'm going to try this again, uh, Chief Etheridge, with my microphone on this time. I guess I was just hoping to hear a little bit about outcomes of the of the program. I mean, you can just hit some of the high points, um, and then I and then I guess maybe just confirm again that um, that my my belief or understanding would be that it might have it might result in less visitation to the emergency department, but maybe not to the point where the emergency department can reduce staff. So anyway, just kind of in, anyway, if you could speak to those two thoughts, sure. thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, I don't believe that the program is designed to uh, reduce the load enough to where they can reduce staff. I think it's to uh, reduce it enough that, you know, it's a tolerable pace. Um, in the last six months, we've seen uh, 376 individual patients uh, that, that were outside of the hospital. And of those, 62% of them uh, were direct referrals from Bartlett Hospital. So Bartlett is our, our biggest referring uh, provider. Uh, we do th things such as wound care, uh, medication management. Uh, we deliver medications for uh, you know, sick people that need IV therapies, uh, uh, folks that are uh, out on the street that need uh, medications for mental health. We'll go find them in the street, make sure that they're getting that medication which also reduces the workload on the police department when uh, people aren't acting out for mental health crises. Uh, and we've done quite a few transports. We've done over 400 transports. Um, uh, we just recently acquired a, a vehicle through a grant uh, to help transport people in wheelchairs that uh, it's very difficult to transport people like that in an ambulance. Uh, and caravan requires uh, reservations. So, um, there's a lot of people with medical issues that can't get to the hospital um, uh, very easily. Um, you know, if they're sick one day, um, short of you know trying to arrange something with caravan the following day, it, it's kind of difficult. Uh, we aren't trying to replace any services in the community. We're trying to be able to fill those gaps and catch those people that are falling through the cracks. Uh, we've been uh, finding people out in the field. Uh, just recently, uh, our uh, paramedics have found a person that was uh, having early signs of sepsis, and they recognized in the field, got them to the hospital, and got them flown up to Anchorage for further treatment. Uh, they've also found people with stroke symptoms that were refusing to go into the hospital because they didn't feel they were emergent. So we're having direct impact on people. Um, we're working with our sleep off center folks and folks with like chronic uh, alcohol dependency or drugs, uh, when they decide that they're ready to start seeking help for those issues, we work on trying to help find uh, where to plug them in and who to get them working with to, to get those needs met. So we're, we're kind of a very fluid program that meets the needs and our, our goal is to solve the, the problems uh, at the base level that we can to reduce the reliance on emergency services and steer them more towards 
the urgent cares and regular care providers and, and not rely on 911 as their uh, primary health care provider. Thanks. And I, I, I was my follow up, but you hit on it was the other thing that we're seeing, hopefully, is that we're going to see improvements in health in people that just that anyway, that anyway, we're going to hopefully see improvements in people's health throughout the community. So that is definitely something incredibly valuable. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wall, then Ms. Hale, then Mayor Weldon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll add on to that. I have anecdotally heard this, heard that this also helps take pressure off our CC of our staff. So it's not just the hospital and JPD um, who this is assisting and members of our community that this is assisting. Um, my question doesn't have to be answered um, tonight necessarily, but I, I did kind of, I was a bit confused looking at the staffing numbers here. They had an original program was one full-time paramedic, two part-time paramedics. Then there was an expansion. Um, and the executive summary of the staffing changes in our budget book um, included a reduction of one FTE. Um, so I, I wasn't quite clear. Um, did the budget represent the full kind of retraction back to the original staffing and that 540,000 is now um, what we are adding to it or I, I couldn't quite compute that with what was here in the executive summary and what was here. So um, don't have to answer that now if that's confusing, but it would be good to understand what the difference is between what's in here, what's in the, the budget and what it originally was. Does that make sense? <laughs> for those, for Mr. Rogers and Mr. Barr? Chair Treem, I, I believe it makes sense and I believe we will need to follow up with okay. afterwards, yeah. Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, to Assemblymember Smith, I think another factor is that this program has been becoming itself during COVID and so any kind of sort of long-term look at data is, is really hard right now. And, and also with the, Bartlett's having some pretty severe staffing shortages. So that's really difficult right now too. Mayor Walden. Thank you. And while I certainly can see that it's a benefit to the community and to many individuals that um, have um, nowhere else to go or don't feel they have anywhere else to go. I'm wondering just, you mentioned transports of folks to doctors and stuff. Is there any cost recovery from this program? Uh, I can address that one. Uh, at this point, there is not cost recovery, but we are working with uh, health and social services to uh, be able to bill through Medicaid. Uh, JAMI currently has the uh, ability to bill through Medicaid and uh, Part of being a partner with them that may uh, potentially open up some doors without having to create new uh, regulation. Any more questions on this, on these positions, this increment? Mayor Walden. I would move the expanded mobile integrated health program to the decision list. <laughs> I see no objection to that motion passes. So the, the final uh, final item, oh no, not final item, there's another page. Uh, next item, Mr. Watt. Uh, Chair Train, we'll bring up uh, Director. Director Schaff, you have always impeccable timing showing up right when we need you. It's like you were listening somewhere. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, mainly, I'm here to answer any questions you might have regarding the increment request. There are two. Um, big picture, these really reflect the fact that the Parks and Recreation Department took on two new programs, two new facilities uh, in the last year, both of which were completely new to us. And in developing the budget and staffing schedule for those programs, uh, we definitely took a lean approach. We uh, did that in the height of the pandemic. And with uh, several months behind us now, we have a better understanding of how these facilities operate and what we need to operate them successfully. So this uh, increment requests uh, for the Spruce Root House and also for the Diamond Park Field House 
uh, reflect um, our better understanding of operations now and, and what we feel uh, we need to um, do a good job at both of those facilities. Any questions? Mayor Weldon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Shaw, for coming here. Um, had a Parks and Rec day yesterday, so that was fun. Um, so in the uh, Spruce Root House, how many kids do they see a month? And uh, how much does it cost to, uh, for a kid, to house a kid per night? Do you know those? Um, through the chair, Madam Mayor, I don't have that information directly available to me. Um, I did. I was asking earlier today what our total numbers of youth served have been since the shelter opened in July, and it is approaching 100. Um, so I can get you specific information uh, on that. I don't have information on the, the cost per youth. I also could get you that as well. Ms. Hale. Thank you. I'm a little bit puzzled just because I don't remember uh, how this all went, but I didn't realize that Parks and Rec was managing Spruce Root House. And um, and that just seems, that's just surprising to me. So can somebody explain why? Mr. Watt. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so big picture, Parks and Rec uh, has many, many uh, tasks that they, they manage. They're probably of all city departments, they have the broadest scope. Uh, and one of the things that they manage is Zach Gordon Youth Center and the Zach Gordon director is managing Spruce Root House. Okay. Thank you, that, that makes sense. <laughs> I, I should have remembered that, but I didn't. I knew there was a connection to Zach Gordon, but I didn't remember that, thanks. Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is about um, this mentions cost recovery at the Diamond Park Field House at approximately 40%. Is that, um, I, I know when we acquired that property, um, there was maybe some ideas about how to kind of increase revenues. Do you expect 40% to be about kind of the max that that, that facility will um, be able to recover? Through the chair, thank you for that question. Um, yes, we do, based on the current fees that have been charged historically at the facility and the fact that we uh, don't wanna increase those fees uh, beyond a level that would really be sustainable for the user groups that, who rely on the, the field house. Um, it's been an interesting year balancing public access to the field house along with the uh, use of the facility by the school district and also the core user groups out there. And um, the reality is that, that our operating costs are uh, higher than they were under the previous management and ownership of the facility. Um, part of that is because of um, the staffing schedule that we have. Part of it is how we're running the facility differently too. So we've definitely increased um, the maintenance and, uh, and improved, I think, the, the maintenance of the facility in that time. So um, in short, Nothing we do really makes money and 40% uh, cost recovery for this. Uh, we, we do feel pretty good about that as, as providing a balance of the community service and, and recovering those costs. Mayor Walden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move uh, both Parks and Rec's additional funding to the decision list. That motion passes. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Chair Treem. So the last item is um, pretty self-explanatory, but this is the warming shelter item. It costs approximately $30,000 per month um, to operate the warming shelter. Resurrection Lutheran has requested to operate for six months instead of five months. Um, they, they certainly found this year um, Mr. Chambor and I had a good meeting with them, but they certainly found this year that they, uh, due to the weather, um, needed, needed to operate for that extra month. Uh, and so they're projecting that again for the next year. And that is why you see this uh, increment. Questions? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would move the warming shelter grant to the pending list. Decision list. I see no objection. <laughs> that motion passes. Um, how, 
how are we feeling? I was just gonna ask. We need a little break. Okay, little break. We do occasionally make mistakes. <laughs> um, no, I, I, it, lots of people make mistakes. Um, the three increments that are included in the manager's budget for the clerk's office are included in everything we've presented to you. <laughs> they're, but they're not actually in the budget. So we're gonna, we're gonna correct that as a technical fix. Um, unless you tell me not to, I, I, we've understood, I think, clear intentionality from the assembly on that subject. So, um, they are uh, intended by the manager to be included in the manager's budget. And that's a mathematical mistake by the finance department that they're not. So um, I just wanted to alert you to that. And if there's no, um, no issues with that, we will proceed to make that correction in the background. Okay, thank you, Mr. You are so diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we are on to CIP amendments. Is there anything you want to tell us? before we start, Mr. Rogers. Uh, no, Chair Fima, I think this, uh, this is your, uh, your show. Okay. Um, Mayor Weldon, are you, you wanna move these for me? Uh, sure, I didn't, or, were we gonna have questions or anything? Okay, okay. Well, let me, I have a question for Mr. <laughs> well, let's, let's, should we move them and then ask this question? I guess it doesn't matter. May I ask where they're listed? Or is it so just the page? It's just the it's page, page 55. Thank you. And uh, page 57 and page 59 is also included in this agenda item. It, 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 Go ahead, Ms. Hill. It, it is pretty hard to, to like try to sync the agenda with the packet because the, there's no titles or anything. So it's really hard to know where you are. Just saying, thanks. Um, I will, I will internalize that feedback. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair. Actually, okay. Yeah. Mayor Walden, let's Okay, do, thank let's you. So on the capital improvement plan amendments on page 55, I would like to, uh, these, I'm treating these differently because these are, um, one-time capital things, they are not ongoing operational items. And to me, there's a big difference between those two things. So with that, I would move to adopt this amendment um, for the Jackie Reninger Park Plan to the Capital Improvement Plan and ask for announced consent. Can I um, jump in there to clarify that that would be $75,000 on the general sales tax funded part? I don't have the CIP in front of me. That part of the CIP? The finance director told me I didn't have to say that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to speak to the mayor's motions. I said I have questions. I object for questions. Okay. Well, since normally the maker of the motion speaks to their motion and this was May I speak to my motion and then you can okay. add to it? Okay. So both of these, um, this one and the next one, both of them are in underserved neighborhoods. And I just think they're a good addition to, uh, we were trying to be more equitable across the board. And I think these are both um, helping us meet that goal. And that's my talk to them. Thank you, Mayor Weldon. And that was my intention with this amendment was to serve a um, the least served neighborhood parks wise in Juneau. And also this is something that has already been on the parks and rec, uh, you know, kind of to do list. It's not a brand new out of the blue project. I actually heard about it from Ms. Elfers. So that's where this comes from. Um, Ms. Huskambis. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I am all for the um, mission to be a little bit more equitable with our funding. And so in, in spirit, I support these as well. I was familiar with the next one and knew that would be coming before us. And I support that one. I just had a question or two about the Jackie Renninger park planning because shamefully, I don't have my parks master plan here with me tonight. I was wondering if uh, Mr. Schaff could answer a question or two. I can't believe that. I know. Real life then. Uh, so I was curious because it says this area is the most underserved neighborhood in the parks open space system. Um, and then with the next one, it says the park is the only park in all of the Lemon Creek area. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. And then if you could give me just a brief little bit about this project, just because I haven't heard of it yet. Thank you for the question through the chair. Um, so that's correct. This particular um, neighborhood, when we look at it from the standpoint of access to say a playground, uh, the, there are no playgrounds in that, in that neighborhood over by the airport. The only park facility we have is the skate park, um, which is great. And it is a, a citywide resource. Uh, Lemon Creek also is, a, is an underserved area, uh, with Segu Yi Park that has been a longstanding playground that we've had there. And now we've also added to that Eagle's Edge, uh, across Glacier Highway. So now there are two playgrounds and city ownership in Lemon Creek. So that's um, based on the standards and metrics in our master plan, that's, that's a pretty good level of service. However, uh, for this neighborhood, which I, I don't know what this, what the proper name for this neighborhood really is, um, but they, uh, there are quite a few homes over there and we use as a standard that um, everybody should be within about a 10 minute uh, distance from a park and a playground. And for uh, folks who live in this area, the closest um, parks and recreation playground that they have is actually, I believe Riverside Rotary Park. Uh, they also have access to school playgrounds over near Diamond Park. Um, so those are the, the standards by which this, both of these areas are, are underserved. You'll have to help me. I apologize. I didn't get the second part of your question. My puzzled look <laughs> says I didn't get this. No, I think you essentially, I kind of were just, I think you got to it. Yeah, I think you encompass that. Um, okay, thanks very much for that. I think you asked for information. Oh, yeah. And this is for the $75,000. Yes, yeah, I'm familiar with Thank you. So this is actually um, a really great opportunity we have because this park parcel is one of our largest park parcels that we have um, in, in really the, the urban service area, the road service area, and it has really not been developed. And so um, the, the purpose of this is uh, it's been a long time since we've developed a new recreation service park, and we need to do a substantial public engagement with the community nearby and see what folks want. Uh, in this park. We have ideas, but uh, certainly we don't have all the answers. And to do that um, the right way, we need to hire a consultant. And that's what this funding would be used to do. And then that will yield a conceptual master plan for the property that we can use to pursue additional funding and, and actually construction. Okay, thank you. So we're figuring it out at this point. Okay, with that, I would remove my objection. I'm really thrilled by both of these. Mr. Smith. Thanks, just a couple questions. So just to confirm the the designation of this as an underserved or area with the least amount of parks, that's just related to CBJ park facilities. That's not including Forest Service, Mendenhall State Parks, like the Mendenhall Wetlands or something like that. Those, it is just CBJ parks. Through the chair, thank you for the question. Um, that's that's correct. So in our, in our master plan, um, what we look at is access to the different levels of parks that the CBJ provides. So we have um, pocket parks, neighborhood parks, and then community parks. They're, they're all basically orders of magnitude and amenities that we offer. Um, there is no standard, I don't believe, in our master plan for access to um, wilderness areas, wildlife areas, and that type of thing, uh, nor is there a standard for access to trails because um, the certainly the EVAR at the airport is, is part of this uh, neighborhood as well. Um, 
but really what we're looking at it is from the standpoint of access to uh, developed recreation opportunities. So playgrounds, picnic areas, courts, that type of thing. Thank you for that. The other thing was just, um, it, it might, it's been on your, on your, I guess your radar or something, but I, you, you have the resources to actually execute this planning purpose. I know sometimes CDD, like we might say, Hey, do this thing. And they're like, we have a agenda. We already have it mapped out or just calendared out. So you, you're able to actually execute it this year. If you, if you were to get the funding uh, through the chair, um, I believe this is for FY23, and that's when we would we would program it. And uh, the answer is yes, uh, we could, but we would use the services of a professional consultant and designer to do it. That's typically what we do for uh, large park design projects like this, because we we really don't have that capacity internally. Okay. Any objection? No objection. That motion passes. Next one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would move to adopt the amendment for the Sagu Wu Yi Park Lighting Improvements um, to the Capital Improvement Plan. And if I may speak to this one also. Go so this is um, the only Parks and Rec Service Park in the Lemon Creek area uh, again, and so it's underserved. I've actually been to this park. Um, thank you to the Lemon Creek neighborhood invited me pre-COVID to uh, join them in their national night out, so I did. Um, so we expect another invitation. Um, anyway, um, the problem with this park is there's no lighting, and so that uh, you can't use it when it starts getting dusk, and it also... Uh, uh, has a little bit of a vandalism and uh, trash problem. Uh, so that's the lighting. I did poke a little bit at the $300,000, but unfortunately that's just the cost of putting up lights. So I was surprised at that cost. But anyway, that's the motion. Thank you. Ms. Hale. I have a qu question about uh, this. The um, Do we know what the residents of Lemon Creek and in the area of the Sagu Yi Park um, you, you, have they had a chance to weigh in? And I, I only ask that because when lights are added to a neighborhood, sometimes that can be very detrimental because it's happening in my neighborhood right now. Um, and I just want to make sure that they've had a chance to, to weigh in on this. Uh, through the chair, thank you for the question. Um, the request actually came from uh, residents in this neighborhood for the lighting, and there will be a more uh, a more robust design process and public process, not only for the lighting aspect of the park improvements, but also for the overall renovations. So uh, the intent here is that this will be additional funding for a project we already have um, in our plans to replace the playground at this park and also to replace uh, some of the park furnishings as well. And in the course of that um, community public process, uh, we will definitely be talking about what kind of lighting people want. Um, and I agree with you, definitely people have very strong opinions about lighting in residential areas. Uh, we have encountered that throughout the community. And we've actually gotten pretty good at the pedestrian scale, low glare cutoff lighting that you see at uh, Overstreet Park. Um, you will see at Capitol Park uh, and that we also have it at Cope Park. Um, so I, I, th I feel confident that we'll be able to give the, the residents uh, something that will um, make the park more usable and, and not uh, objectionable. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And I have also been to this park when I was campaigning and also when I was working with Rotary on the trail across the wetlands. So that's a really nice, uh, it, it, it may not be a park, but it's a very nice trail across the wetlands to the schools. So that's a, it's a nice feature and it's not far from this park. So thank you. And I will follow up to your question. I, this request was brought to me by a resident of Lemon Creek who was telling me that one of their neighbors in the 90s, 80s, 90s was asking for a lighting in this park when their child was playing in the park. Their child grew up, moved back to the neighborhood. Their child was playing, the grandchild of the original requester was playing in this park and they were still asking for lighting. So I think this is something that has um, been a desire of the Lemon Creek neighborhood for quite a while. Wonderful, thanks. Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, on that, I guess, is there, is, was, was this lighting on 
project list or something. I mean, I, I searched through the CIP and I it didn't, it wasn't on a program dot in another year. Maybe it was too small of a dollar amount. I guess it was there. It just never had gotten to the point of being funded or tell me about that history. Uh, through the chair, that's a very good question. I, I don't have my CIP list in front of me. I don't believe it was ever called out as a discrete project on our capital improvement plan. Um, the way that our park improvement CIP really works is that we, we work down the list based on age. And we have not really taken us a long look at uh, improvements to this park until now, because uh, basically its turn has come up. Um, it's, it's now the second oldest park in, in the community. And um, it really, uh, the, the, the impetus to include lighting um, was driven by uh, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, uh, the residents, and, and uh, from the assembly. Certainly, I, I can say that um, including lighting in, in our parks is something that we are doing more consistently going forward. It's, it's becoming a standard feature in our parks as we, we work to improve them. Any more questions? Any objection to that motion? I see none. That one is adopted as well. So the next, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, the the next one, and thank you, Mr. Schaff, for being here to answer us. Uh, my discussion with Mr. Rogers and Mr. Smith makes me understand that this is more of an information item. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my intention on this was just as we have the circulator planning, I wonder what's the actual name and the CIP, uh, circulator plan for using state passenger fees for $100,000. Um, my thought is if we are engaging professionals to look at downtown circulator systems, I would at least just like to consider or take a look or have people who know this to say, does some type of fixed infrastructure transportation work? And by that, some, I mean, it seems a little, I admit it seems kind of crazy, like a trolley or we're not going monorail, I suppose. But anyway, something like that. It does seem rather intense. I get it. However, I have just heard um, from people I've worked with in the past that fixed infrastructure transportation can lead to more investment because you now have this line, a rail or something going in, into an area and people are like, well, that is, that is gonna be that transportation there for likely sometime in the future or as a bus, someone could shift the route tomorrow. So that was my, that my intention was to just kind of drive it. I don't wanna make it the focus, but if there is, if there are smart people looking at circulator options, I would just hope they, that it's at least being considered that was the intention of my very formal um, CIP amendment here included in the packet. Um, and, and then when I had spoken with, I, I was looking for the text or whatever the response was from Mr. Rogers, but my understanding is that, that asking that or putting that into the, into, the, into, the pro, into the project would not increase, they didn't feel it was gonna need to increase the cost. If, and if that looking to staff to make, confirm yeah. that. So. Mr. Watt. Uh, yes, just to confirm, I, uh, that will definitely come up in the planning process. And I, and I would say there are many visions of circulators and many purposes uh, that people are going to have. Um, and some type of fixed infrastructure has come up in the past. Uh, before he passed away, Mayor Fisk was a really big advocate of streetcars. I think I might even have a streetcar book somewhere uh, that he'd given me. So. Uh, we will we will talk about that, um, and I would imagine that that whole planning process will grow uh, beyond what we initially contemplate. Um, so, I don't believe we need to make a formal motion unless you want to. That's fine. Also, but does anybody have any um, questions or comments? I guess on this proposal from Mr. Smith. So you guys are good with your instruction? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay, that brings us to 
the final items on our agenda, updates on investment income and budget summary and fund balance. Mr. Rogers. So thank you, Chair Treem. I think we can move through these two items expeditiously um, tonight. Um, starting on page 60 of your packet, 60 and 61, um, we, this is our best effort to, to um, write down on paper what, what we expect to be a really prodigious investment loss in, in the current year, FY22. Um, interest rates uh, or to total performance of the portfolio is currently estimated by our advisor to be negative 3.73% for fiscal year 22. Um, negative 3.73% isn't a really big number considering how far many other kinds of investments uh, move have, have moved this year. Um, but on a $168 million portfolio, uh, it's a bunch of money. So um, we will, we expect to lose on the order of six and a quarter million dollars. Um, when I say lose, because really um, the portfolio will decline in value by that amount. And, and the math we've given you here is to illustrate that when we talk about writing down, um, when we talk about adjusting fund balance, it's not just how much we've lost, it's the difference between how much we've lost and what we thought we would earn. So, um, so for example, with the general fund, we forecast a $1.7 million gain in the general fund. Um, and we're actually now projecting to lose 2.8 seven, $2.8 million. So the net difference, the net change from the budget is uh, around four and a half million dollars. So when I come to the budget summary in a minute, I'm going to, um, I'm going to point to that four and a half million dollar loss. And you will see that across all of the funds that we assign revenue interest income to. Interestingly enough, we don't assign interest income to every fund. It's actually not practical. Um, for all funds that are not listed here, the general fund receives investment income and investment losses. So um, the amount here that's reflected for the general fund is also inclusive of a lot of other money um, that sits outside the general fund, including all the money that's been allocated to capital projects, the money in the risk fund, et cetera. Those, those are all considered um, the income that comes from those goes to the general fund and the losses that come from those likewise goes to the general fund. Uh, but you can see the impact on the enterprises. Um, we are So for example, Bartlett is a slightly different case and it's unusual because we're now forecasting an almost $2 million loss for Bartlett. We, t we forecast 1.2 million in revenue. So they would have lost 3.2 um, something. Um, but, but Bartlett made a decision that at the time I, I will acknowledge we disagreed with to over project their investment income in their own budget above what we forecasted. Um, and it's a mistake of the markets, right? We had several years where our investment returns far exceeded our budgets. Um, finance has been signaling for a couple of years that that would not continue and we'd eventually give that back. Bartlett made a decision to over project investment income. So their loss from their budgets almost $4 million, but that's in part because they over budgeted. And <clears throat> the, the, the chart or the series of charts on page 61 is intended to, to, to illustrate this phenomenon that I've been describing for some time, which is that as interest, as short-term interest rates fall, our, uh, the value of our portfolio goes up. And as interest, short-term interest rates rise, the value of our portfolio goes down. And I won't go into all the reasons why that's the case. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but um we are required under GASB rules to follow a mark to market concept, which means that we own a security um, and we are required to report its, its, its saleable value um, during the year. And that's where interest rates matter because what's interesting about a fixed income security is that we, you know, we, we, you know, a bond works just like any other loan. We give somebody a million dollars, they pay us 2% every year until that, um, until that loan pays off and they give us the million dollars back. So, so it's strange to think about losses in a fixed income portfolio. The problem is that, you know, if somebody, if we give somebody a million dollar loan and, um, and we get 2% interest for it, and then all of a sudden prevailing interest rate is 3%, well, I could no longer sell that $1 million loan to somebody else because they can get another loan 
that's going to pay 3%, right? So the value of that loan, the value of that asset, that fixed income asset actually goes down um, in terms of its saleable value, that mark to market. And we have to do that. And so what you saw on this page, on page 61, in FY19 and FY20, that was largely un, what we call unrealized gains, uh, but we were required to account for them as gains. Um, and then we're giving it back in FY22 as unrealized losses, but we're required to report them that way. So, um, you know, the thing I'm trying to illustrate here is that over a very long period of time, our investment portfolio is going to reliably produce uh, a relatively predictable amount of income. Um, as we have these cycles where interest rates rise and fall rapidly, we are going to see these kind of adjustments. It feels like a huge loss. I mean, we really are going to lose you know, $6.2 million across the value of our portfolio this year. But at the same time, we received more than that in excess returns in uh, 19 and 20. So um, this is normal market activity. This is kind of your financial advisor says, let it ride, don't panic. This is the moment um, would be my guidance. And, 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 and if your question is, is there anything we would do to avoid this? The only option is to have a portfolio that is even more conservatively invested, um, which is not recommended for a municipality our size. Ms. Hale. Uh, thank you. Uh, so th this, this loss, and I do appreciate your preparing us so that we can be thinking about how they balance out because you know we all have our IRAs and things like that. But it, does this loss translate into less money in our FY23 budget or is our way of saving money that doesn't impact the budget? So assembly member here, Ch Chair Treem, um, it's uh, the, the value loss to the portfolio is a, is a real cash loss that we will record as a cash loss in all of the funds where we record investment income or losses. However, um, our, our financial advisor does, our investment advisor does expect that um, our returns will normalize in 23. Um, I was just looking at a document here that was sent to me by the investment advisor. They, they expect something on the order of two and a quarter to two and a half percent as the return in 23, based on their forecast of where interest rates will go and what securities they'll buy and sell. That would be normalized income for us. So this is a one year problem. Next year, we should receive typical investment income. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rogers. My, my question is, this is not going to, like, we're not going to, these budget documents we've been working with, we're not going to see a big hole in the amount of money we have available in our budget for FY23. Um, you, you are going to see fund balance as of the end of the year, FY22, be four and a half million dollars lower. And okay. I'm going to show you that when we get to the next page. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Let's keep going. I, see, I don't see any other questions. Yep. Okay, good. So if we want to just roll into the next item, um, I... Uh, it made there we've so much has happened. Um, it made sense to come back and like take a big step back. And I and I and I did this intentionally. And if it works for you, I'll do it again next year. I mean, next week you're going to start making decisions. So I I thought it made sense to like come back to this and put you in a slightly different place. So everything highlighted here in yellow has been um, added by the finance department. Um, uh, re recently, since, since the last update of this. Um, you see 6.3 million for New City Hall. That's obviously pending. That's on your, uh, that will be on the agenda in June. Um, the transfer to the Affordable Housing Fund, you did. Augustus Brown, you 3 million for Augustus Brown, you did. IT upgrades is pending. That'll be in the June meeting. Um, the appropriation to Teal Street is, is pending for the June, uh, no, pending for the May meeting, Monday's May, Monday the 16th meeting. Um, Lemon Creek Mosley Molo Path for a million dollars. You did that. Eagle Crest Gondola Transportation, you approved tonight for 500,000. Um, we baked this in for 800,000 because there was a question, I don't know if you saw in the title, but we said up to 800 and it's 500. So this is actually overstated by $300,000. We'll correct that. Um, 500,000 for JPD uh, radios, you did that. Um, 300,000 transfer to the downtown parking fund, 250 for North Douglas Crossing. You did all those things. And then 
uh, down on lines uh, 158, 159, uh, reduction to investment income. So that's the four and a half million dollars that we're losing in the general fund this year um, as a result of the investment loss. And then um, this 572 is actually just almost impossibly difficult to explain. Um, we, so it, you have to look up above. So where it says ARPA funds replace state marine passenger fees, 11.9 million. That would have been true if no ships had come last year, because the, the way the state grant worked for that was that it was a hold harmless. So we would have gotten ARPA funds for all of what we would have received otherwise in passenger fees. However, some ships came. So the state didn't give us $11.9 million. They gave us $11.9 million um, uh, less 572. And so we got that full amount, but the 572 went to the passenger fee account. So it, it's complicated, but so, so all that, all basically all that replacement for passenger fees, you put in the general fund, we are required to take 572 of it and put it back in the passenger fee account. So that's a correction there. And then um, just, okay, so, so then just fully tracking this, what it would look like, and it's kind of crazy if you look at your next graph on the next page, we'll get there. Um, the final year end projected now, uh, 182 and a half million of revenues, 200 and a half million of expenditures for a little more than an $18 million deficit. Um, any questions about that? <laughs> Ms. Hale. And I know it's late. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rogers. Um, so the reduction to investment income of 4.5 million um, in, in other years, those increases to investment income, have those added to our fund balance? Correct. So th that's one of the reasons why our fund balance has increased. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so the numbers that this bottom pink line is based on, those include all of the pending items as well. Is that correct? Uh, Assembly member here, Chael Trim, that is, that is correct. All of the pending items that are pending in FY22. No, I mean the, the ones that you have the bolded pending. Yeah. Uh, yes, those are variously on your agendas in either May or June. So Teal Street is you moved to the June, to the May meeting and then new city hall, IT upgrades and um, that's, that's it. it, you moved to June. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, I'll just keep tracking forward. So um, on the next page, you'll see uh, where we are with the manager's budget. Um, that doesn't change now, but I've I've roughed in a couple of things just to get get our heads in the right place. Okay, so um, two million dollars of wage and benefit costs. Um, that number is totally subject to negotiation. I don't have none, none of us have any idea what that number will be. I think we have good reason to think that it will be at least that high. Um, I've also uh, baked in $2 million of impact from decision list items. That number can be a zero, um, but I anticipate you are going to grant some of these requests. Um, so, and then, um, and then we get to the, the big kahuna of things, which is um, announcement of a $16 million grant to CBJ. So if you could turn to the very last page of your supplemental items, which looks like what Adrian's going to put on the screen, but it looks like this kind of small print. Um, we got word uh, maybe 10 days ago, probably not more, that the Senate had inserted into its version of the operating bill um, a provision that would um, that would repay municipalities for all of their accumulated unreimbursed school bond debt. So we've sat here now for many years agonizing and wringing our hands about what to do with unreimbursed school bond debt. Um, the state has now, the Senate has now put a provision into its budget, put, started by putting a provision that said, we're gonna repay all of that back. The house followed suit. Um, we do expect that, um, that that will survive the legislature's budget and we, um, you know, the counsel from our lobbyist is that there's really, at this time, no indication that the governor will veto it. Um, so it may be practical for you to start thinking that we're going to get another $16 million from the state relatively unexpected. Um, you can see on the last page of the, of the supplemental items how it breaks down. It doesn't particularly matter. $16 million 
it jives with what our understanding is generally. Um, so coming back to the budget summary, um, adding all the things you've done in 22 as, as supplemental items, which gets you to an $18 million deficit. And I know the word deficit gets to be funny because you've, you've made a conscious decision to spend fund balance. Um, but then also looking at the FY23 budget. So the, um, you know, you started with a three and a half million dollar deficit in the manager's budget, $2 million in wage and benefit costs, $2 million in decision list items would have gotten you to a seven and a half million dollar deficit. However, $16 million unexpected turns a seven and a half million dollar deficit into an eight and a half million dollar surplus. Um, and we've also, we typically do this, this is the first time we've done it in this document, but we do eventually plan for uh, some level of lapse. Um, so inclusive of that lapse, you get all the way down the final year, uh, year end projected with the $16 million of back pay for unreimbursed school bond debt um, gets you to a $10.5 million surplus, again, after all of those items included the lapse, which would take um, which would take fund balance, total fund balance, unrestricted fund balance from 10 and a half million at the end of this current year, again, up to a little more than 21 million. So if Adrian will pop to the, um, to the, the chart, um, this starts to look a little funny because we're in strange times, um, but it's, it's real. It's just what it looks like. So um, that big red bar is, you know, a deficit. But as I said, I think it's just fair to say what it is. You've made a conscious decision to spend down fund balance. Um, and you can see fund balance go down until it goes back up again. Um, because we, we just continue to get um, yet additional tranches of money from the state. Um, you know, uh, uh, don't, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, I guess. And Mr. Rogers, we'll know for sure about that, I guess, when the governor signs the budget. Yeah, correct, Chair Treem. So we, we are often in this situation where um, before you finish the budget process, we will know what the legislature does. The legislature will pass a budget before you pass a budget. Um, but under normal circumstances, CBJ, CBJ Assembly under normal circumstances will pass its budget before the governor has made vetoes. That's not always true. We're really close in alignment. So depending on, um, kind of depending on the math and how quickly the governor moves, uh, we may know vetoes, or the governor may sign the bill or, uh, or we'll know the vetoes before you make final action on the budget. But uh, in most years, we don't. Okay. Mr. Smith, if you could move along that process quickly. <laughs> and, and Chair Dream, I appreciate Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith has been talking with me for some time about this particular measure. It's been an effort, many people um, in, the, in the legislature trying to move toward that, that repay of school bond debt reimbursement. So I've, I've been talking to Mr. Smith some time about those numbers and that process. Uh, just, just very recently, it, it came in the bill, so we started talking about it more. Okay, any more questions on this? Anything else to come before the Finance Committee tonight? Okay. We're adjourned. Nope. Sorry, we're not adjourned. I take it back. Mr. Smith prevented us from being <laughs> Sorry. I was just going to ask, um, maybe for the decision list, if we could get like a sum of the, at least the GF request over proposed column would be helpful or like a running total, like some, some way just so I can, it can help me get the full breadth of the, or the full magnitude of the list. Thank you. We can add a total. Okay. Yep. Okay. Now we're adjourned. Thank you.